Uh. Right. Good evening. How are we all doing? Now, before anyone starts to think, why is he grimacing? What's wrong now? Um, I, I, I managed to go away to Centre Parks. I managed to do cycling, kayaking, all sorts of things, even pedaling, and um, fine, completely fine. I come home. And going out the front door to walk the dog, I managed to twist my ankle. So, um, yeah, my girlfriend probably now has a sincere belief that if she's not watching me, I'm going to get myself into trouble. Anyway, that's, we'll, we'll talk about that all later on. Let's say hello to everyone who's here. Who's here? Uh, we want to have it on live chat rather than top chat because that's always a bit weird. Hello, King's Rook. Hello, Alistair Crown. Crow. Hello, Jay Richardson. Hello, Sean Mack. And Daniel Freeman. Hello, Joshua Peters. Hello, The Purpose Side. Hello, GGV40. Albert Zasky, good evening. Calvin, uh, Calvin Gasbo, good evening to you too. Did I miss the first... Uh, uh, no. No, you didn't, Calvin Gasbo. I resented on the Blackburn Blackburn. Mm, Adriatic, it'll come in time, but I'm doing more research first. Hello, Adam Crow. <laughs> hello, Dope Squad. Uh, hello, Bug Guy 8829. Hello, Jeff Beeler. Hello, Greg Stadowski. Hello, Seth Thompson. Yes, I did get your good wishes on this gorgeous effort. That's very kind of you. I haven't responded yet because I'm currently waiting for a whole mound of emails. But also, that is the reason why anyone who sent me a message during the last week, if or for really last two weeks, because I was prepping and then I was away. Um, yeah, I, I'm, I'm sorry. I, I was a sort of busy last week, let's say. Kings, did the start time suddenly jump 30 minutes for anyone else? I hope it didn't. I started off the start time a little bit early. Good afternoon, Blue Shirt Butter. How are we all doing? How are we? <laughs> we have a good selection of books. Yes, I've changed today's topic, but that's because... Honestly, I was getting so many questions about some of the... Books on the four random books. I thought I would save that topic for when some new books arrive that are arriving. And have a ribbon and do it then. And I would do the four random books topic now. It was a lot of fun being away. I have to admit though, for next week's one, which is I think the new books episode... It's got, um, well, these are the books being reviewed for the new books episode. So, they're all being read. Um, some of them were even wandered for, uh, bonded, uh, borrowed a bit by my girlfriend at times over the um, holiday, so they've got some extra opinions going on in them. Hello, Angus the Sonnum. Hello, Jay Illingworth, and hello, Aviator Enterprise. Right, so. And if you're thinking I have a slightly funny voice, this is what the effect of deep heat does to me. Basically, the gas given off by deep heat, it's very, very helpful when it comes to the pain. Um, however, it does make my voice go a bit funny. I do apologise. But as it stops me going, ow, 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 every time I move my feet, it's worth it. Ah. Although I'm still going to do that slightly. 
<laughs> uh, <laughs> that's got is the belief unfounded um i'm having feeling this goes with dan freeman's i suspect your girlfriend is right about you needing constant supervision that is basically most of my family's view it's a kind of strange thing when i'm doing really um <clears throat> some quite high risk and stuff like that i'm usually perfectly fine if i'm going to get injured it's doing mundane silly things like taking the dog for a walk, just literally walking out the front door, Matt flies under, out from beneath me, and I twist my ankle. It's, it's that sort of thing that happens. <clears throat> Jeff Beeler! I'm not even going to read that out there, just in case the mere mentioning of it gets it suggested in very, very many places. Ay, caramba. Ay, caramba. Seriously. Why would you do that to a man? Why would you do that to a man? Down here, in the first 24 hours, uh, there is a little bit of cold on injury. Yes, I've been putting on ice packs as well as deep heat. Don't worry. Ah, <laughs> oh, yes, it's been fun. So. So the first book that's generated questions, and basically what I've done is the books which have generated more than five questions sent to me over via Discord, Twitter, or YouTube comments, I have put into this episode. This one generated a lot of questions. Um, Civil War. The Wars of the Three Kingdoms, 1638 to 1660, by Trevor Royal. Now, there was quite an interesting response on this one, because some people were sitting there going, but it's Trevor Royal, and I go, but he's quite a good historian. Yes, occasionally there are bits in here which are a little sensationalist, but if you want an overview of the, civil, of the British Civil War, and I do call it the British Civil War because... The, uh, the, there's this whole thing, it's called the English Civil War. It involves Scotland too. Quite a lot of Scotland. And Wales. And Ireland. And large part chunks of various European principalities. Um, it's not just the Civil War in England. It's not just a nice fight, you know, on the Dales. It is all over the country. New IKB7472. Hi, Doctor. What did I miss? Nothing much so far. John Shea. Hello. Thomas Warner. Hello. Don't worry, I start early. Buckamere. Good evening. <laughs> oh, God. Jeff Beeler, stop poking Carl von Gasberg with ideas for what to do with a Blackburn Blackburn. I love you both dearly as, sub uh, as subscribers and chatters, but uh, on YouTube. But I have to admit, it, 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 between the two of you, I do worry that I will end up doing a lot of Blackburn, Blackburn content. <laughs> oh. Thomas Warner, I had no idea it was English of War. Um, the English of War effect on North America is quite interesting. How is it mentioned? It is covered in this book. The fact that it takes place, it has an impact on the North American colonies. The fact that it has an impact on who goes to North American colonies afterwards, but also who went there before it. There's all sorts of interesting things. This is a very good book for covering it. I would say it ranks in 
a lot easier to get for in many respects than the Stuart Age, but that's also another good book if you want to consider it. And there's more about this in episode in Four Random Books, episode one. It's all covers this book. And the whole idea of four random books is that I cover four books in a roughly 15 minutes. Once in a while, I even make it to actually do for covering 15 minutes. But this is the quality of the writing. As the summer of 1643 drew to a close, all the advantages appeared to lie with the king. In the north, west and centre, his forces only inflicted defeats on the parliamentary army, which, whilst not decisive, had lowered morale and reduced its fighting strength. Soldiers who find themselves all too often on losing side easily become dispirited, especially if they begin to lose faith in their commanders, and with the exception of Cromwell, Fairfax and Waller, the parliamentary leadership had not excelled. Key points such as Oxford, Bristol, Newcastle, and the West Riding were in royalist hands, and following Newcastle's success in Yorkshire, and Lincolnshire, the East Anglian counties with their agricultural wealth were under threat. If they fell into Charles's hands, the way would also be open to attack London from the north. Parliament's supremacy at sea was also being diluted by the creation of an embryonic royalist navy. The first ships being those captured after the fall of Bristol, and the money to operate them coming from local merchants. This proved to be a boon during the autumn, <coughs> when they were used to transport men and supplies from Ireland to North Wales. Better still, they were all able to carry out their duties unhindered by any opposition. Warwick, the parliamentary naval commander, was facing mutiny amongst his fleet as a result of severe underfunding and was rarely in a position to order ships to put to sea for convoy duties. There was also continuing unrest in Parliament, where Pym's declining genius was finding it even more difficult to control those who wanted a negotiated peace. He also had to keep his more bellicose colleagues in check, and when the fiery member for Berkshire, Henry Marron, made the outrageous suggestion that it were better one family, Charles's, should be destroyed than many, Pym had him expelled from the Commons and imprisoned in the Tower of London. This was undoubtedly Parliament's lowest point, but at their time of adversity, when their only hope of hope let help laid with the Scots and Henry Vane the Younger's negotiations in Edinburgh, the first steps were taken to produce the army which would retrieve the parliamentary position. The new army of the Eastern Association, under the command of the Earl of Manchester, formerly the Lord Mandeville, whom the King had attempted to impeach. On 10th of August, a parliamentary committee was formed to empower the Eastern Association, which was based in Norwich, to raise 20,000 men in constant pay to protect East Anglian frontier and from time to time send out scouts to discover how and what manner any enemy approacheth near the frontiers. Although Manchester was not a trained soldier, he possessed energy and commitment to cause and was a sound administrator who believed in treating his men fairly and well. Not that raising an army was an easy matter. Men rallied to its ranks as much through coercion as through in any enthusiasm for the war. But it proved difficult to keep them. Pay was often not forthcoming, arms and equipment were lacking, and the whole enterprise was marked by inefficiency on a grand scale. Throughout some well into the winter, Cromwell's letters ring to his frustrations of the system. In one, he points out that he has been forced to pay for boots out of his own pocket. Another warns his men would lose their patience if they did not receive pay and equipment, and a postscript agonises about the end results of these shortcomings. The force will fail if some help not. Weak counsels and weak actings under all. Send at once, or come, or all, all will be lost. If God help not, remember who tells you. On the credit side, he had teamed up with Henry Ireton, a driven man and a good soldier, who has become Cromwell's second-in-command and later son-in-law. If the balance was tipped in Charles' direction, that did not mean that everything was going his way. Whilst he held the upper hand in the north and the west, two obstacles prevented him from achieving his ambition of combining his forces of attack on London. These were the strategically important fortified towns of Gloucester and Hull. Both needed to be taken before further thought could be given to the wider picture. Gloucester controlled the upper Severn Valley with its lucrative wool trade, while Hull and its protected port was the key to Yorkshire. As long as they both remained uncaptured and surrounding area, could hardly be secured, and in Hull's case, as Newcastle's forces were ra was raised and funded locally, it had to be taken before campaigns elsewhere were considered. Charles also realised that the fall of both places would be a tremendous fillet to his cause, and a further blow to Parliament's dented morale. This is a good book. It is a narrative history. But if you want to understand, there aren't many of this the complicated nature of this war and the reality of it versus what is sometimes the very simple 
portrayal given to it, this book is a very, very good place to start. The Civil War, the War of the Three Kingdoms, whatever you want to call it, is not a simple fight between King and Parliament. There are a lot of interests involved and a lot of different peculiarities going on. King's Rook. You say that like Blackburn Blackburn content is a bad thing. Mm. I never thought I'd spend as much time talking about it as I have done. I like Blackburn content. I'm not sure about Blackburn Blackburn content. Mainly because... I think it's an idea, the Blackburn Blackburn, which only comes and it comes off fruition once you have radar. I think the Blackburn Blackburn's modern successor is the Hawkeye and the new Crow's Nest Merlins. It's airborne early warning. But it came too early and it looks ugly as... Mm. Dirt Squad. The English Civil War involved the longest war in history between the Dutch and the Isles of Scilly. It lasted from 1651 to 1986. And trust me, if the Dutch hadn't surrendered then, it would still be going. Uh, <laughs> sorry, couldn't resist. Um, Kingsrook. It may be uh, very momentic, and the thing is, after all, but it isn't bad. Yeah. A ma uh, Jeff Wheeler, a major percentage of the pop male population in New England went home to fight, and many stayed there to be part of the Republic. Yep. A healthy proportion of the model army. Nick Waters, hello? Hey, name drop. My venture scout unit was named after Henry Arton. Married Cromwell's daughter. Yes, he did. Hello, June 9191. Thomas Warner, is Venture Scouts the English version of American Boy Scouts? Oh. There are lots of scouts and various scout units in the UK. Thomas Warner, I, where, Doctor, where can I find a book? Uh, it's on light reading. I've put it, all its name and details in the description below this book. You'll probably find it on Amazon or... Um, Oh, I'm trying to remember the other good one or website online for books. But it's not much. When brand new, it was only £16, and I doubt it's gone up in price since then. It was published in the UK and Canada. Where in Canada, it was $29.99. Um, Surf Tectonics, hello. If the cruise marine could have continued commerce raiding with the 12 battlecruisers after the Bismarck sunk. 12 battlecruisers? What other help the U-boats cut off Britain and 41? Well, if they'd had 12 battlecruisers, that would have definitely helped. But I presume you're, you're meeting the, the sort of the Scharnhorsts. And they did try to continue to use those ships. Um, the Scharnhorsts. Although... Nisenau was taken up about the same time to have her guns upgraded. And the Germans do continue to try and use them. If they'd had the full complement they'd wanted, they would have been far more problematic. If they'd had an aircraft carrier, they would have been far more problematic. Basically, you make the threat manageable when you make it one-dimensional. So if you concentrate on a U-boat threat and that's all you're posting, and you're all you're putting against the British, then it's quite easy for the British Americans to concentrate their efforts in producing things like corvettes, frigates, sloops, trawlers, in huge numbers to do the anti-submarine warfare, and huge numbers of liberty and victory ships. But... The moment you start bringing in a bigger threat, another threat, you have to start dealing with it. 
So those small escorts are very good at dealing with the anti -sub the submarine threat. Because, to be honest, to take on a submarine at this time doesn't require a lot. It requires an ASDIC. Hopefully requires an anti-submarine mortar when that becomes available. Or depth charges. A gun or two to deal with them if they're on the surface. But to deal with a cruiser or anything bigger than that requires a lot more firepower. So this is the thing, if you have a multiple, a multi-threat axis, if you have aircraft, surface ships and submarines, you can do a far more effective trade embargo and attack on trade. Just ask the Germans what the British were doing to them. Or the Italians what the British were doing to them into the Mediterranean. That's it, basically. <laughs> uh. Thomas Warner, what even is a Blackburn Blackburn? I'm just going to say, just go to the videos on Blackburn aircraft in the 1920s and 30s. It's explained then. Don't believe half the mythology that's coming around on here. Okay. The British Civil War, a good name, not one I've had before, but I like it, was in part a multi-party religious war. Plus, to be honest, Charles I was a twit we'll go with. Yeah. He was. He really was. Do you know what? I, yeah, I found that book in a bookstore. Was tempted to pick it up until I saw the price tag. Yeah, it is a good book. Zerp Squad. Adventure Scouts is the oldest group of scouts. It goes beavers, 5 to 7 years old. Cubs, 8 to 11 years old. Scouts, 12 to 15 years old. And Ventures, six Scouts, 16 to 18 year olds. Mm hmm. I was asking, it's as if the next US Air Force fighter was called the Boeing F-49 Boeing. Yeah, that would be quite funny. Do you know one on Got a uh, grass zeppelin. Bad idea, and that's the direction. The guy who said the 109 would be a good idea for a carrier needs to be shot. <coughs> Look! You know, the Germans weren't going to develop a new, a, 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 a separate aircraft. They just weren't. So it was always going to be a 109, and it's like the Spitfire, that's the Seafire, it would have worked. It wouldn't have been great, it would have had issues, but possibly considering the Graf Zeppelin's size versus the size of some of the escort carriers the Seafire operated from, it could have been okay. It would have been interesting, it would certainly have been not the most effective vessel in the world, but it would still have been a carrier. It would still have been a threat the British would have dealt with. Because you have to remember, we know all this about the Graf Zeppelin looking back now. We know it looking back now. If the Graf Zeppelin, if war hadn't started till 1942 and the Graf Zeppelin had been available... The Royal Navy could not have presumed the carrier was an effective, it wasn't an effective ship. They would have to act and they would have to operate on the assumption that it was an effective carrier, that it was a capable vessel of war. And they would have had to prosecute it as such. That is the thing. If you have the capability, if you have an aircraft carrier, it's like with the Chinese aircraft carriers now. They may be great, they may be terrible, it doesn't matter. We have to act and develop our strategies based on the idea that they are capable. Because assuming your opponent isn't capable is not a good or sound strategy or a sound basis of thought. Um, Dan Freeman, 
the F-190 was not really considered for the carrier. Thomas Warner, the Germans had a carrier. The Germans were building a carrier, yes, the Graf Zeppelin. And actually, uh, the one of the people I'm going to talk about in a bit, Marcus Faulkner, has written several articles about it and really is the authority. So if you want to look, if you look at Marcus Faulkner, you can find some of his papers for free on the various journal download sites. And it's actually excellent what he gets into and the detail he provides. I like King George V. Mm. Sir Director, Hassler, Hitler recalled all the German warships from the Atlantic theatre after Bismarck sunk, only operating in the If Raider continued, Atlantic got sworn. Um, if they had continued, that would have still been a threat. Honestly, Hitler is very, very conservative with his heavy units. So is Mussolini. That helps the British out enormously because the British are prepared to risk them that just much more. It helps. Abazowski, did Germans manage to develop a carry usage doctrine or just decided to build one because of other powers have it? Pretty much it was the latter option, Albert. Pretty much it was the latter. Zaf so Thompson, in regards to capability, why I try to go for things like Henderson Wood. Okay, what are the guidelines? Now what's the exem exemptions? Also, I think they're a gen ahead, so you're ready. Pretty much. Hello, Yikers. Hello, Dunrick Ironhammer. Hello, Carl Harmon. But no. Getting back to this book, The Civil War, quickly. This is a good book. And it's a good historian and it's a good approach. If you are looking for something bigger, more detailed on everything, um, there is the Barry Coward book, I think it is. Um, the Stuart Age. England and uh, England, uh, 1603 to 1714, which is very, very good, but is very, very much a textbook, an academic university textbook. It's something if you're doing history at university and you've studied the Stuarts, you would definitely have had to read at some point. Greg Sassy, yet another production line was the last thing the Germans needed, though. They already had too many designs, and the 102 was outperformed by the 109. Welcome to the world of the Germans versus the Brits, who were cutting down production lines. It's like, classic example is the Fairy Fulmar production line. It's only short term, we'll build something else, so we're, only, we're not going to keep developing it. And then people go, well, by this point in the war, it was falling out of fashion. Well, yes, but by this point in the war, it was the same aircraft that had entered the war the uh, that had been available at the beginning of the war. They hadn't upgraded it. The same the Blackburn Skewer. There's a reason they fall behind. Aircraft design and engine speed and engine power moves on tremendously quickly. As suddenly there's a whole lot of money going into these things. Mm. <laughs> oh. And now thirty.
So, the next book is from episode two of Four Random Books, and it's a very cool book. It's also one which, surprisingly, a large number of you said, I've never heard of this before. I've never heard of Noel before. No Mostarat, Line in the Wind. Line upon the Wind, the greatest war fought at sea under sail, 1793 to 1815. <clears throat> this is one of those books which gets very, very little attention. Again, ten ninety nine in the UK when new, twenty seven ninety five in Canada when new. Its picture is the Battle of Camperdown. It's got these lovely plates in it. Lots of good content. Lots of interesting stuff about the people. It gives you a really nice idea of the world in the period, and I like that. But what I like most about it is it isn't a book which is the greatest hit. So many of these smaller books on the Age of Sail are basically greatest hit to greatest hit to greatest hit. You can predict the battle the battle list they'll be giving you in seconds. But this one it goes through it all. It has some great chapter titles, it has some great sections, it has some great maps and plans for those of you who are interested in wargaming and talking about it and it's just... It is a good little book. The 17th was the century of the rise of the navies. At the start of the century, the commercial exclusivity upon the great waters attempted by Portugal and Spain was already gone. The determining race for power and mastery upon the seas had begun, with the Iberians already seen as the weakening participants in the race against the swift rising powers of England, Holland and France. Navy had not yet resolved into a for any firm concept of permanent standing navies. War at sea was depended upon existing any existing warships being hastily supported by armed merchantmen. Sea fighting itself remained in its brawling infancy, since still heavily influenced by galley fighting. Nowhere had they yet arrived at firmly defined tactical rules for sea battle manoeuvre, or set governing rules governing use of sail and wind in battle. Much less were their sustained ideas embracing grand oceanic strategy. Ocean was still too large a vision for comfortably adjusting existence in most Western minds, which were yet too obsessed with the religious convulsions of Europe to be seriously distracted by goal still too abstract. Terrestrial conflict was the principal menace. Military power, land fighting and armies therefore naturally remained the predominant concern, diminishing the role of navies and their professional evolution. But since the struggles on land were seldom far removed from the Atlantic coasts or the North Seas of North and West Europe, the Channel and North Sea, it was in those confined waters that Western Netherlands had to find its evolution. All of Europe was convulsed by the last great surge of religious and dynastic upheaval, at the heart of which burned the bitter enmity between Bourbon, France on the one hand, and the alliance of the Habsburgs of Austria and Spain on the other. Europe was plunged into crisis and from crisis into prolonged war. The conflict that raged from 1618 to 1648 became known as the Thirty Years' War, more cruel and savage than anything else so far. Out of that bloody upheaval would emerge a new Europe, and with it, new and different concepts of naval strategy. The Thirty Years' War might well be regarded as the single period that delivered naval strategy to the Western mind, bringing with it the concept of the, that deployment of naval power could seriously hamper or affect the battle fortunes on land, and with it the fate of nations and destinies of empire. And it restored the Mediterranean to a central role in Western maritime history. It was with France, however, under Louis XIII's chief minister, Colonel Riccolo, that the strongest effort to restructure naval power was begun. He laid down a program for a fleet of some 40 major warships, half of them 34 to 40 gun ships. But Riccolo's greatest contribution was it may have been his innovation establishment, innovating establishment of the principle of a navy of, in two seas. 
with an Atlantic fleet at Brest and a Mediterranean fleet at the new naval base he established at Toulon. France's own Mediterranean naval strategy was thereby set in motion and dramatic impact when France finally entered the Thirty Years' War in 1635. Riccolo had seen his new base at Toulon as a key to defeat the powerful Austro-Spanish armies that were fighting the Dutch in the Lowlands and the Germans east of the Rhine, and be fighting the French along their own German frontiers once France became fully involved. Riccolo's surprising and original strategy centred upon Toulon as a means of cutting Spanish supply and reinforcement off its armies inside Europe. For Spain, the shortest route for maintaining her armies inside the continent was from Corona up through narrow seas to the Spanish enclave of Dunkirk and on to the Spanish Netherlands, modern Belgium. But that had become impractical. The Dutch, with their experience and belligerent navy, controlled the narrow seas. Denied the direct supply route through the narrow seas, Spain, narrow seas, Spain alternate route of supply and reinforcement, had to lie through Genoa. From there, they passed to Milan and thence through various alpine passes to the Valley of the Rhine. Toulon became Riccolo's base for cutting communication between Spain and Genoa, thereby undermining the whole British Spanish Opera Austrian campaign against inside the continent. That shift of the Brest fleet to Toulon initiated the great strategic deployment that had prevailed in French naval policy in the future as it shifted fleets to match requirement. If not Brest to Toulon, then Toulon to Brest. Toulon became a name, a strategic determinant to be coupled eventually with that of Gibraltar. The two were to become the opposing points of critical strategic command in the western basin of the Mediterranean. From the Straits to the Italian peninsula, they would create a maritime reach of transcendent importance, where in Mahan's memorable words, Preponderant naval power determined gigantic issues, swaying the course of history again and again in successive wars of that century, and thereafter, when it was not chiefly in the clash of arms, but in the noiseless pressure by the navies, and largely in the Mediterranean, that the issues were decided. It's a good book. Okay, let's see. The pub side, just to let you know, I've ordered your book. Thank you. It's always very nice that people have ordered my book. Mm. Dan Freeman, I feel the USN def fairly definitely demonstrated the best thing to do is to design carry aircraft from the beginning and then offer to go uh, to ground forces if they wanted. That was definitely the better approach, yes. Static seems a bit rough, or is that just me? Ooh. Well, if there is static, um, please tell me and I'll try and figure it out. I'm not sure why there would be static, but I'll see. Uh, so I'm not sure. Mm-hmm. Hot Starrens, anything on the East Indian campaign? Yep. Lots. Sure, Mac, King George V, but the steam catapults really make it. If you, uh, you know how the Japanese did deck load strikes because it was good enough until it wasn't. The Germans could only do deck load strikes. Hmm. New RKV-4472. I wonder what is the one-way range of 109 drop tanks. Not far enough, really. Jerichson, sorry, had a spider alert on my desk. Can't find its remains. Mm-hmm. Um, Sir Tretronis, how long did it take the Royal Navy uh, for uh, take a Royal Navy galleon to sail from England to Australia, or did they just switch ships in India? No, they went the whole way, but they would tend to stop in India and months. Depends on the season and the winds. If they go at the right time of year, they could get there quite quickly. Well, relatively quickly. Um, I have the figures actually somewhere. It could be as little as 40 days, I think. Or was it? No, I don't know. Hang on. It 
It depends on the how thing, but it's 40 to 70 days. Usually, most of them seem to be around 60 days on my notes. But some did manage to make it quicker. Mm -hmm. Dev Scott, totally off topic, but I'm writing a quiz for some friends. I meant to ask about uh, last bound answer. 19 questions over three rounds, roughly enough. I would go for 24 questions, and then you have some spare. Have bonus questions, just in case they get through them quickly. Because the last thing you want to do when you're having a quiz, and I know this from teaching classes, is to have the students all get done. You get allocated a certain time you think it's going to take them to answer the question. And they're all done and waiting and looking at you for the next question. And you're going, right then. And as you've been through this so quickly, before we get on the next round, I'm going to add in a bonus question. It, it sounds good and it makes people happy when they think there's a bonus question. Also, have it so that if you get the bonus questions right, you get a box of chocolates or something. So you get the winner. Here's the person who gets the most questions right. But the, the team who gets the most bonus questions right gets another box of chocolates. I may do this for students quite a lot at the end of the year. It's a good thing post-exam prep. Rapid race back. You have one reading speed. Warp. Breathe, man. Welcome back from holiday. Yeah. This is the trouble of being a professional historian. You do read a lot and you get very quick because you have to because you have to get through so many books in one or two days. Is there a way to get a signed copy of the forthcoming book from Buccaneer? Um, I'm going to work on that. I'm hoping to do a sort of signing at some point if um, if COVID allows. And basically just do a, you know, a launch party for the book. Where did you get that shirt? <laughs> Some of my students bought it for me years ago. Well, it can take six months, uh, Daniel Freeman. It can take a lot less. Uh, the figures I've got. Let's put it this way, it can take months going round the Cape and going back, and you have to remember that adds on time. And I'm trying to remember if those figures I've got actually are post swears or pre They are for slow moving ships, so they're about the same um, same speed as sail, but they might be post swears. I'm not sure, but yeah. So actually, I'll restrain the earlier statement on days. It could be longer. Probably is longer. Derp Squad, new IKB4472. Dr. Clark, given that the 109 had about 10 minutes fuel over London, Lord in Northern France, I would agree that the 109 didn't have sufficient range, even with tanks. It also didn't have a second seat, and... Pre-radar, the reason you have the second seat, and people also go, is for navigation of the aircraft, to keep it safe so it can go to range. Because also, if you're having, if your aircraft to, is only going to be survival as long as it keeps roughly within visual range of your aircraft carrier, that's not going to be a very useful air defence aircraft. It can't operate a long way from your ship. And especially when you consider the way dogfighting action goes you dive in you're fighting where's your ship how high are you gonna have to get to be able to spot your ship and if there's cloud cover yeah whereas you have an observer you have a beacon system you can do that John Shea in the second book which Ricklu Cardinal Ricklu So 
Seth Thompson, why the emphasis on Toulon? Unless my Geo is off, aren't they already blocked in by Gibraltar by then? Why, why not focus on Brest? Because Toulon is in the Mediterranean, and you've got a Mediterranean coast, and you want to block off the Spanish from supplying Italy. It doesn't matter. Basically, Toulon is not about going into the Atlantic. Toulon is about controlling the Mediterranean. So we think about Gibraltar as controlling the Mediterranean, access to the Mediterranean, and exit from the Mediterranean. That's why the British want it, because they want to stop the French fleet from getting out to link up with the fleet in Brest and suddenly having a larger navy. But, basically, Gibraltar is about when your enemy willingly divides his forces, let them div be, stay divided. The French, for the French, Toulon is about being able to intercept Spanish trade going to Italy to supply their troops up in Germany that will be fighting in the northern of France. So... It's a sort of long way round strategy. Angus Asano, you never offer chocolates. I have get shared with you all the wonder of Iron Brew. Tom Doc Warner, Doctor, what do you think about a sinking HMS hood? I think that <coughs> sometimes we all get lucky and all we get unlucky. And I think Hood is a classic case of it being sort of unlucky. Juno 101, if you do a party, you'd better live stream it. Mm, if I do a party, it'll be a bilge pumps party. Come on, guys, what? Any rock star band designed their gig for the, at least two hours of bonus For at least two hours. Bonus songs, probably those. Which really moved them over it. Yeah. The bonus songs tend to be the songs that have come out on previous albums that are the classics, which everyone really, really wants to hear. Not just the new songs from the album they're currently promoting with their tour. Now, for instance, wouldn't it be highly dependent on Favourable Wind? It always is highly dependent in the Age of Sail. Thomas Warner, take care. Dan Freeman, or uh, Rapid Razor, all aircraft are compromised between range and payload. You can say that again, and it fits rather with what the next one is. The reason I've been allowing Graf Zeppelin to carry on and talking about it is because it actually fits with what this is the third book. Asuka, I thought the Graf Z was designed for use in short-range engagements, hence the huge gun battery. Um, it was designed to have the huge gun battery because they didn't think that they could keep the enemy away. It's designed pre-radar, Okay. You, uh, if your visual range, it's basically the Germans are worried about what happens to Courageous and Glorious happening to their aircraft carrier. Pre them doing it to Courageous and Glorious. Dan Freeman, Marseille's is a bit close to the Italians. Nice was Italian until Gary Boulder gave it to the French as a thank you for support in the Italian wars of unification against the Austrians at Hal. Yes, plus Nice would have caused him a lot of issues. Dev's gone. That's like The Spanish had the same feeling about naval base in Cadiz. It controls the Straits of Gibraltar fairly well. That's true. Although Gibraltar tends to control Cadiz quite well when in the history when the British wanted to. Plebiscite. On a sailing time to Australia, Cuddy Stark had the record at 72 days. Presumably that's the fastest that a sailing ship could do it. He... Dan Freeman, I feel the FAA should never have got rid of the Swordfish. Considering there are a couple of flying models sitting at Duxford, and there are a couple of flying models sitting down in Cold Rose for the Fleet Air Arm historical, historic flight and all that sort of thing, we could bring them back and operate them from the Queen Elizabeth class. It would be fun. It would have been interesting. Um, Greg Stahowski, uh, Dan Freeman, Swordfish in the Falklands. They might have stood a chance versus the Pukara. And if I got that wrong, my girlfriend will kill me for pronouncing that badly.
David Rag, Soulfish. The story of the Taranto Raid. On the 6th of November, the illustrious set sail from Alexandra, accompanied by four battleships. Cunningham's flagship Warspite, Valiant, Malaya and Ramillies. As well as an escort of cruisers and destroyers. Surprise was an essential part of the operation. The merest hint that a major attack might be on its way and the Italians could be counted upon to remove their fleet to safer waters further north. Perhaps to Naples or surf of Sicily to Genoa or La Svezia. Experience thus far had shown that this was the more likely option, as they had shown great reluctance to be drawn into battle. As the strip steamed westward, the full miles of 806 helped to provide cover for MW3, which the fleet spotted on 8th of November. After driving off an Italian reconnaissance aircraft at 12.30 and again at 15.20, seven uh, Savoia Machetti SM-79 bombers approached at around 16.20 and were attacked by three of 806 full miles which managed to shoot down two of the enemy aircraft and drive off the remainder, which jettisoned their bombs in order to make a hasty retreat. Cunningham, as an added security precaution, deliberately pointed his ships towards Malta rather than further north towards Toronto. On 9th of November, Cunningham sent cruisers and destroyers ahead of the main body of the fleet, ostensibly looking for the Italian surface vessels, but perhaps hoping to give the Italians one last chance to sally forth and present him a major fleet engagement. Allow what he would achieve at, Ka at Matapan. Meanwhile, Ramleys took three destroyers to see the convoy into Malta and to refuel. Using Malta as a refueling point, given the many demands on the island's scarce resources, may seem odd in retrospect, but convoys were still getting through to Malta in late 1940. The problem was that British warships were remarkably short legged, a legacy of having so many fueling stations in a widespread empire, and the Royal Navy and its main its fleet train, the Royal Fleet Auxiliary, lagged far behind the United States Navy in the techniques of refueling at sea at this stage of the war. That is where he goes wrong. They have all these capabilities, they just don't have enough fleet oilers because they're being used for other things. As we've discussed before, the Royal Navy has plenty of fleet orders on or oilers on order, and if it had been a war against Japan and there'd have been no Battle Atlantic, they'd have been fine. They'd have had all these ships, but with the Battle Atlantic, they needed though you were using those oilers for the convoy routes to get oil and fuel across the Atlantic. They were using those oilers for amphibious ships. They were using those oilers for lots of other things. So that is why there's a shortage of them at this point. But it doesn't matter because they're fighting in the Mediterranean and Atlantic where they have a large number of bases. So they can refuel. So you can make a choice. Is, is it more useful to have at sea refueling here or is it more useful to getting more fuel across the Atlantic? Full stop. Up-to-date information was vital. Even before the ships sailed from Alexandria, daily reconnaissance photographs were being taken by the RAF, normally using a Martin Baltimore bomber. All of the combatant nations during World War II could tell tales of inter-service rivalry and bureaucracy which made, it in the, made the efficient and effective conduct of war more difficult. In Mediterranean, the problem lay between the Royal Navy and the RAF. In the uh, run-up to Operation Judgment, the Mediterranean fleet relied on good air reconnaissance. Only the RAF in Malta was in position to do it. Though the photographs were requested by the naval CNC, they were regarded as RAF property. They were flown from Malta to RAF's headquarters in Cairo, where just one naval officer was allowed to look at them and was refused permission to take them away. The officer concerned, a young RNVR officer, Lieutenant David Pollock, a solicitor of civil life who had a specialised in photographic interpretation on joining the Royal Navy, made a great show of marking the disposition of the ships and their different defences on a map of Toronto, and then, when his RAF counterpart was not looking, promptly borrowed the photographs and returned to his ship. The RAF never realised the subterfuge, as the photographs were copied in the carrier's photographic section and replaced the next day. The copies were taken to Lister and Boyd. Stereoscopic lenses were used for a close cruising as expert photographic interpretation was fundamental to good intelligence work, especially in wartime when many other sources were closed. What Lister and his officers wanted was ships, as many as possible. There would be a little point in a raid that did not inflict severe damage on the Italian fleet. They were not to be disappointed. The outer harbour contained five battleships, three of the Cavour and Delulio classes and two of the new Littorio class. There was also three cruisers in the outer harbour, as well as further cruisers and a number of destroyers in the inner harbour. In fact, only one Italian battleship was missing. The availability of suitable targets for this unique chance of striking the Italian fleet solved the main problem, but it was also the matter of the enemy defences. 
The breakwater of the Mar Grande was lined with anti-aircraft guns, more worrying given that the aircraft would have to fly low to drop their torpedoes so they would not shatter on impact of water. Were what looked like a collection of maggots, white against the sh shades of grey on the reconnaissance photograph, they were the telltale signs of barrage balloons flying from barges moored along the mole that sheltered the outer harbour from the sea and guarding the flanks of the battle fleet that did not have the protection of torpedo nets. Other balloons were attached to barges that lined the shore. The barrage balloons were more of a nuisance than a serious threat, provided pilots remembered where they were or could see them in the light of the flares. Since they were positioned some 300 yards apart, and the wingspan of a swordfish was a mere 45 and a half feet. It's a good one. It is a good book. As I said, I don't agree with all David Ragg says, because he does repeat some of the popular tropes about the Navy, which aren't quite correct. But it's still a good book. Surf Tectronics. Uh, the goal of the Luftwaffe in Battle Britain was to destroy RF fighters. Chain Home Net directed Spitz, uh, Spitz and Hawks Hurricanes to ME 109s. Yes, so, why destroy the. Why not destroy the uh, uh, radar tires? Because honestly, it was only later that the Luftwaffe seems to realise that those. Radar towers are not sea surface search radars, but are actually air search radars. Dan Trim, does the RN view the Spanish Navy in Cadiz as a useful potential source of fresh ships for emergency use or recruitment to this day? Uh, probably not so much these days. It's more complicated, as we covered in bilge pumps. As the cow, navalized ME 262s if graph say a Zeppelin was built later in the war. Oh. <laughs> Rapid Razorback. Was the swordfish wood or metal framed? Now you've asked the question, I now cannot remember for the life of me. I think it was wooden framed. But. It was a metal airframe covered in fabric, so it was metal. Swordfish was a metal airframe. So, so for the Spanish and the Med, the Malta to close would be worth it, the taking in my eyes. You pretty much. I love the idea of putting swordfish on QE, if only for expression of the US, uh, US Marine Corps contingent of aviation types lying at size faces. It would be quite fun to watch. Night down, Richardson. Hello. Hi there. It seems to be general Q&A time. So, Dr. Clark, I came across... 
an alt timeline with Vanguard in the Falklands. It had the ship opening action being a bombardment of Argentina in the Question, how likely is that? Seems to me that it might have been um, by the international community as an escalation. Um, yeah, no, it wouldn't have been used. It wouldn't have been. It might well have been arrived at near Port Stanley. They might have turned it up to Port Stanley and blasted the life out of the defensive line in the mountains from over the heads over Port Stanley just to go. Do you do you really want to throw this? Do you want us to lower these guns and start pointing at new point blank range? Um, I don't know if you'd had. Eagle or Ark Royal still in service, and you'd had Buccaneers and Phantoms aboard them as you would have done. Again, I don't see a strike aboard a strike on the Argentine mainland. I do see the Phantoms and the Fairy Gannets putting implementing a very successful air blockade. I do see there being a f the Buccaneers taking out pretty much anything which could be taken out by air support. It's a very, very different scenario than the one you end up with. We're not quite in the general question section. We're only at book three. But, you know, we're carrying on. I'm being slow going through books this evening. Do you know what I know? Was it the illustrious that had a fire on board before the throne parade? Or was it one of the other carriers? I, I know Indomitable Eagle was that Eagle. Indomitable wasn't there. Ark Royal was off in the other side of Atlantic, but Indomitable wasn't there at that time. It was illustrious and Eagle, and Eagle had a fireboard, so they had less strike aircraft. If they'd had Eagle as well, they would have been able to take far more strike aircraft than the Toronto Road would have been that much bigger. If they'd had illustrious and Indomitable... I doubt there would have been many Italian airships surviving because between them the strike package would have been quite heavy. Pretty much would have doubled the strike package. If not actually more because you could have sent in some full miles as well because you'd have still retained enough for air defence of the group. So you could have increased the strike package and the variety of that strike package quite heavily because the full Mars could have basically turned the mole into a death trap for the anti-aircraft gunners there. And that if, if the Royal Marines didn't, don't have a plan or somewhere about cutting out the ships at Cadiz, then I don't know what the point of all setting planning and training is. I'm sure they do have plans somewhere, knowing the Royal Marines. They have plans for pretty much everything. Room. Didn't military aviation or military history video do a vid on why not attack radars very soon? Um, part of the answer was it wasn't easy. Well, it is true. It's not that easy to attack them. They are very, very small targets when you're used to bombing very large things. They're also designed so that the explosions will not have as much of an impact, so they're going to take quite a lot of firepower. But, saying that, and you are right in pointing out it's the command and control system, but if you want to blind the command and control system, you take out the radars, and then it doesn't matter how good your command and control system, you've taken that out. But you also have to remember, it's not just the radars, it's also the Royal Observer Corps, who do a very, very good job of raid profiling, heighting, height, range, and all these things. Rapid Racer, I know it's outside the scope of the topic, but I'm trying to get people not into history to look past names and dates. I need books to tell good stories. We've got some books coming up on that. We really do have um, some books coming up on that. Don't you think Roosevelt and Winston would have contacted a way for America to declare war on Germany so it was advantageous for U-boats to attack East Coast before USM was ready? 
Um, concocted away. If they'd been able to, they would have done it earlier than they did. Than it happened. Frankly, it was Roosevelt has to deal with a significant no war in Europe lobby, peace in our time, pro-German lobbies, and all these things. If Hitler hadn't declared war, it would have been very, very difficult for him. They would have loved to have concocted it. Winston would have loved to it. If Winston could have done, Winston would have done so. But they couldn't. Uh, MW3. I've heard Taranto was a diversion. What were they diverting stuff from? I'll discover one. Convoy, MW3. Basically, they had convoys going both ways across the Mediterranean, and they were using Taranto to keep the Italian fleet busy. Dan Freeman, Reef Falklands and Vanguard or a fleet carrier with Catabar. The Gannets and Phantoms would intercept Argentine attack aircraft before they could get range to, dro drop, to, uh, range to drop to Dodge Radar? Probably. It would have certainly made the Argentinian job very, very much more difficult. Do you know what I know? Wait, was it Indominal or Madpan? I don't know, I can't remember. It's formidable. And again, if the Royal Navy had had formidable and illustrious uh, to launch it. Basically, in the Royal Navy's dream world, they would have had two or three carriers to do the Taranto attack. Or they'd have had Ark Royal free, but they were using Ark Royal as its own diversion by her attacking Genoa, which made the Italians very sure that they were safe because the strike carrier, the big famous carrier, wasn't going to Taranto. Rapid Razor, who takes care of the fluffy research system when you go on holiday? The family. Mom, my mum and sister. No, he didn't trip me up or st to stop me going away again. He was actually more shocked than I was. Mainly because it meant that his walk didn't take place, because I was sitting there mildly howling in pain. Right then. So, it's 01. Right. This is an ever loved favourite. British warship design in World War Two. Selected papers are from the transactions of the Royal Institute of National Architects. And the reason this comes up quite often is so many people ask me, what does it have in it exactly? If I buy it, what am I going to be getting? Well, you're going to be getting a foreword written by Anthony, Admiral Sir Anthony Griffin, Ships of the Invasion Fleet by R. Baker, Merchant Aircraft Carrier Ships, Mac Ships by J. Lennigan, British Submarine Design During the War, 1939-45 by A. J. Sims, Corvettes and Frigates by A. W. Watson, Coastal Force Design by W. J. Holt, and Notes on the Development of Landing Craft by R. Baker. R. Baker is the guy in charge of basically he's how to put this he's Stanley Goodall's deputy who does the day to day running of building the invasion fleet. And you have plans, but what you also have in this thing I love some of these plans. Corvettes and frigate designs, everything in here. If you want to sort of it's a, a forerunner of these rather lovely books, these, you know, these books which I like to point out. These ones, the original builders of guides. Well, yeah, ooh, there you go. Don't look everything too far back. We'll go flipping over. That's better. Um, it has all that stuff in it, and 
For example, here is a Castle class Corvette, and I'm not sure if you can see it that one well light. But it is beautifully inscribed and all the details are put in. And this is what they were working, working with. Flower class Corvette. And there you go. More details. It's a really, really cool book. But also, what they have at the end of each paper, which is the thing which is really, really cool. And they have all, if you're modeling them, they have all the tables, all the details of their operations. They have the discussions. And here's the thing, as I told you before, the Admiral who's actually in charge of setting up Western Approaches Command is Admiral Sir Percy Noble. And here is his contribution to the dis discussion on corvettes and frigates. Admiral Sir Percy Noble. The submarine of the future will have a far higher speed. In fact, I've heard 25 knots mentioned. If this be so, must we have much faster escort vessels? This is Admiral Sir Percy Noble. The China Station Commander in 1939, the Western Approaches Commander at the beginning of World War II, the guy who goes off and helps organize America, all these things. This is actually him asking this question. And the various people responding. And these are all experts and what they are. And there's an author's reply to discussion. It's just... It's amazing the information you get in here. There's a full discussion of the Schnell boots, the, uh, from the British perspective, the um, steam gun boats and what they get up to, and they're all their designs in here, and all their structures, and how the various things they get used for. It's an amazing little book. I really can't recommend it high enough, but I do know it's very difficult to get hold of. So, I want to say it's lovely, and I want to wish you luck in getting hold of it. New IKB-472, if the UK still had a Catabar carrier or a battleship, then the Argentines might not have got ideas about the Falklands. That could have been the case. Nick Waters, is it right that after Pearl Harbor, the US didn't initially declare war on Germany, Italy, and Hitler followed the pact and quickly declared war on them? Yes, he did. Interesting, what else if he didn't? Um, it would have made things complicated. Hello, Bellanora. <laughs> Did anyone just worry? Um, I would like to say, Daniel Freeman, I would like to offer say that I have never fallen out of this chair and hurt myself. But honestly, I have. <laughs> my girlfriend still and my family, both, all, all of them cannot understand how I have managed it. But I have managed to fall out of this chair. But that was pre my changing the feet on it. Um, the old feet were mm, a bit problematic. Because I've had this chair a while. Um, I really like it. But I've had it since I was about 15. Um, it was a present from my mum and my granddad, and so I still have it. But over the years, I have had to had to replace the wheels. I've had to replace the um, supporting structure underneath, because the original one was very firm plastic, but it was plastic. And apparently, the amount of hours and work I do in it are going to break it down. Nighttime production. I don't want to keep on topic, but I was more in the mind that those ships in 82 would have been in the RN Mothball fleet, and you by most as simply waiting for scrap. And included Vanguard, as the good doctor made a case for retaining the ship in I a ship in Iowa State of Mothball, near uh, reared with American rearmed with American 16-inch guns in previous brew ships. It would have been the case. It would have been sensible if we had done that.
So let's start turns. Uh, Brit radars were advantage uh, were advantage friendly 109s flew high escort bomber weight to dive attack as many our fighters before them uh, they ran out of fuel until full switch close bomber export. Yeah, their advantages and disadvantages. Then if you remember, rearming a battleship was not an easy thing to do. They had complex hoist lifts to move the shells, and changing calibre or even length of type of shell can cause massive problems. It can, but with the 15-inch guns, Britain had plenty of those in stockpile if they wanted to keep to the 15-inch. And if they wanted to change the 16-inch, they could probably have got that work that done quite easily and use it as a job creation program. So there's options for it and Vanguard had been built with the ability that they could have be upgraded to a 16 inch. Things are bigger in a 15 inch between a 15 inch shell and 16 inch shell but they're not so much bigger that it's a massive change. Ben Lorna, been having a laugh in the past few weeks reading some alternate histories that have very wildly impossibility, both in scenario and some of the actions. Yes, well, I've been working on the Suez Crisis one for this week, and that's been a bit um, interesting. Nick Waters, Visions of Stargate era episode where Hammond comes back just to reclaim his leather chair. I concur with that man. It's my chair, I'm keeping it. Um, But no, good book, very good book. Uh, Dan Tone, uh, yeah, so I take it everyone saw Drax Drydock this morning with Vanguard plus 16, probably. It's quite a good thing. Before I get to the start, I'm going to disappear for a second. Mainly because I've been drinking this stuff as pain relief. Definitely wide low coming through. <laughs> right. Um, Juno 191, would you consider Vanguard a modified Lion class or its variant class of ship? I consider its own class of ship. It's not really a modified Lion class. It's a what do we have available? What can we build? What hull do we have sort of ability to build? Rapid Raceback, you and Drac definitely need a moderator for bilge pumps. This is why we have Jamie. 
This is why we have Jamie. And he is a superstar at it. Kings Rook, regarding those alternate sewers timelines, do any of them end up with Canada and the UK at war with each other? Not really, because the thing is, the sewers does go hot, there's fighting, and then the British pull back. Would the Americans go to war with the Brits and the French? There's, a possible, of course, a possibility, but it's unlikely. The reason the Brit Americans are ordering them back is they're worried about the Egyptians turning to the Soviets. So they want them to not go and not, not sort of start fighting. The question is if the, the real likelihood of it being hot is the Soviets decide to enter war on the side of the Egyptians. At which point, whilst NATO would technically not isn't supposed to active i wouldn't be surprised if nato did activate because it would be the chart it would be a slow start it would be a rumbling start of a of a war but i'll get into that another time mm-hmm Right, so, next book, and someone asked me earlier, they were looking for books which would get people into history, who were looking for a good history. Narvik by Donald McIntyre, it's an oldie, but it's a goodie. And the reason you can tell it's an oldie, because when it was originally published in the UK, it was priced at 30, feet of 30 pence. In Australia, it was 95 cents. In New Zealand, it was 95 cents. In South Africa, it was 75 cents. And in Canada, it was $1.25. Canada, you are expensive. I love you. I don't get to visit you often enough. But you are expensive. I need to come and borrow a very special icon of yours. She's called Haida. But um, I'll take good care of her. But, um... Yeah. Narvik. By Donald McIntyre. And the reason I love this book is this. 900 miles from his base. And with the British Isles fleet at sea. And strength to intercept him. The German commander's only hope of breaking out. Was to sail at the earliest possible moment. Before the advantage of surprise being lost. This he had been unable to do. For one of the two tankers. Which should have been at Narvik. To review all his ships. Had not arrived. And only the converted whale ship. Jan Wellen. From Amance was available. Destroyers each required between 500 and 600 tons of fuel. Not only was this far beyond the capacity of the tanker, but her pumping arrangements were such that transmission of fur of fuel oil was very slow and only two destroyers at a time could be served. Commodore Frederick Bonte, however, was not unduly worried. He could sail on the night of the 10th when he was confident of evading enemy patrols by a high speed dash through the night. The naval command would then arrange for tankers to meet his ships at sea. Meanwhile, U-boats were on patrol in the Vestford, which would give him ample warning of any hostile forces and perhaps be able to damage them also. His powerfully armed ships could then be get up ready to give a good account of themselves in the narrow waters of the Uttlefjord. It was unfortunate that a battery commanding the narrows did not exist, but to back up the U-boat pickets, one destroyer at a time could be stationed in the Uttlefjord before being relieved as necessary for the refueling program. While waiting their turn to fuel, two destroyers would be berthed off Ballingen, 10 miles to the westward of Narvik. Ours would be in the Hengensford, running north from the main fjord. 
The remainder, except the one on patrol, would be in the harbour of Narva itself, where the tanker lay. To the senior officer of the 3rd Flotilla, one of the three flotillas of which the German forces were composed, the duty was delegated of ensuring that these arrangements were carried out. Cohen Avante was thus able to face the night, it was to be his last on earth, with a quiet mind, particularly as at 8.22pm there came in a signal from U-51 reporting five British destroyers in Westfield, steering southwest, away from Narvik. There was evidently no immediate attack to be expected, so the German flotilla settled down for the night. In the bitter cold and the failing snow, lookouts huddled in their thick clothing, cursing the fate which put them on watch on a night when, in the, any case, they could see nothing but drifting snowflakes. The ships which U-51 had glimpsed, heading westwards between the snow schools, had been Captain Warburton Lee's flotilla, which we last saw heading up Vesterford and intending to arrive at Narvik at 8pm on the 9th. On his way, Warburton Lee pondered the inadequacy of the information in his possession and in the, its doubtful source. A press report on the situation in a remote minor port beyond the Arctic Circle, that one German ship had arrived and landed a small force, was neither dependable nor easily uh, credible. He dared and bethought himself, therefore, of the pilot station at Tranoi in the Vesterford. Arriving off it at four in the afternoon, he sent ashore to learn what the pilots could tell him. As he expected, the Germans were in greater strength than he had uh, than had been reported. Six warships, larger than those of the British flotilla, as well as a submarine, had gone up the fjord, the pilot said, adding that the entrance to the Otto Ford was probably mined. The Germans also held the town of Narvik in considerable strength, and the English would need twice as many ships as they had, Norwegians gloomily estimated. The Germans were not the only ones, however, who knew the value of surprise. Sniggling his fresh intelligence to the Admiralty, Warburton Lee added, Intend attacking at dawn, high water. Now remember what I said about Royal Navy officers talking to their senior officers. If a Royal Navy officer says, it is my intention to do something, that is Royal Navy code, that basically unless the senior officer believes that that action is woefully stupid or woefully unwise, they will let them proceed because the Royal Navy functions on an objective system. So Warburton Lee has been sent an objective, go and do this, and he is now telling the Royal Navy, his high command, what his intentions are. I, it's not a requesting permission, it's telling you, this is what I'm going to do with my force. And therefore, unless they really, really think it's a bad idea, they shouldn't stop it. So let's track 1,400 years pilots switched to Royal Canadian Air Force in 1940. So is there, uh, is there lost records on how many US pilots flew RAF fighters in Battle Run? Not really. We know quite a, a lot of them. It's just they have interesting records of their stats. Do you know one I own? They're making a movie on Narvik. Yahoo. Ooh. Well, I wish someone would get in contact with me if they are. I'd be happy to help them with it. There are pretty detailed records of the RF pilots in the Battle of Britain on the British side. The RF were colour race blind, so it is the West Indian pilots who are missed out. Um. Yes and no. They, there should be far more made of them, yes, and there are Indian pilots, there are West Indian pilots, there are all sorts of things that they can base, and yeah, they don't get enough coverage, but if they're not exactly expunged from history either, they are there, it's just, we need to make more of the fact that they are there. It's one of those things, it's, it's more a case of overlooked rather than hidden, if that makes sense. This is a sort of part of the mentality at the time, which was, of course, they're there. They're part of the Empire. Of course, they'll come to our aid. Don't.
Mm. Dan Freeman, a shilling was twelve. Surely, yes, we should understand sort of. <laughs> the book price was in pence. Although, if it was thirty pence, it would have been post decimalization. Yep, thirty p. Dan Freeman said, and the Nelson bit is to sometimes not be part of, uh, be at home for those orders. Uh, a bit like Rommel in France in May 1940. We may finally get to see Warspite on the big screen doing Warspite things. I hope we get to see Warspite Swordfish on the big screen doing Swordfish things. But no, it's a very, very cool little book. But... You can't really stop there. And so... For those of you who can't find that one, I have a newer book. Attack at Dawn by Ron Cope. Now, I love this book because Ron Cope is, as I understand, is a relative of someone who died and took part in Narvik and all the things. So, uh, as he says, My interest in the sea began very early in my formative years, and this, along with my dad's stories of his time in the Royal Navy, probably later led to my following in his footsteps. Mm. And he has lots of connections, and therefore is interested in the battle. And he's talking about his dad... And all the things he did. Anyway. So. The same week, there were other ships leaving harbour, but they were not British. In the 1970s, my father, Cyril, had met a, new, a number of German veterans from the Battle of Narvik and arranged reunions in both London and Bremhaven. They were from all ranks, and one of them was a corvette and Captain Carl Schmidt, who was in command of the Erich Gies. She was on her way to Narvik, as all will become clear. However, their past adversaries were now friends, and moment mementos were exchanged. Amongst the many gifts presented to Cyril as the Honourable Secretary was a diary kept by Carl Schmidt of the events leading up to and during the battle. Here is the beginning of Carl's diary, translated in English. Other parts will be interspersed in the following chapters. April 6, 1940. Departed from Bremhaven to Narvik with 200 Austrian Alpine soldiers on board. Still continues, they had had their guns and torpedo tubes taken off, replaced by rails along their sides with mines installed. They were in line and we were either side for protection. The captain cleared lower deck and told us we were going to the coast of Norway, called the Leeds, escorting those destroyers to lay mines off Narvik. He then said, now I will tell you why we're going to do it. Iron ore ships can come down from the coast from Narvik. Then they normally come out into the open sea, but German iron ore ships don't do that. They come out of the fjord and go through the Lees, which are still inside Norwegian territorial waters, a neutral country. Therefore it has been planned to mine the entrance to the Lees, so German ships can't go in there and risk being blown up, forcing them out into open sea, where our forces can attack them outside the territorial waters. That's the plan. Now when the destroyers have laid their mines... It will be a new minefield and not charted, so we need to remain in the area for 48 hours, watching out for and warning neutral shipping. The theory was that Hitler can make war for only a year if he's denied the supplies of Swedish iron ore. That was written by Fritz von Fissen, one-time personal friend of Hitler, to Winston Churchill. It's a very, very good book. I have to admit that there are parts of it which are jumpy. But it is a good book. And it provides a lot of details. So, in its... It's going to sound strange. This was published... is This wonderful little book... 
uh, was published in 1959, first edition, this edition published in 1962 by Pan Books. This was published in 2015, so it's kind of easier to track down. Dan Hill, read on RF Cruise. Very good point. Much better made than mine. Knowing there was a pilot pilots coming through would have been a relief for Dowling and Al. It was. Nekwad is concerned. A bit concerned a movie will try to spin Norway campaign as an allied victory. Uh, it was an allied victory, but it was an allied... It was both sides could honestly have got made it worse. Um, Jerison, some bit work was complaining that Hmm. Yeah. There are lots of people getting involved all over the war. Everyone from the world gets involved in the war. In pretty much every theatre you find people turning up. Considering, I think part of the issue with hidden pilots and others is that, uh, that after the war, certain places either did not want to recall those events or is not deemed um, worth the effort. To an extent, things changed. Did I intend to ever turn into my well into my well intentioned one? Mm. Side says. Pound, shilling, and pence money are different from ounces, pounds, and stone. Wait. Yeah, we're fun. Imperial measurements are cool. Do you know 191? That's right. Narvik and German subs can be summed up in two words. <laughs> Premature detonation. I know, I know. That was a little bit of giggling from me and um, Draco that, but it was just a case of we're both doing the reading and everywhere we came out... These German, these German sailors were keep uh, officers were keep complaining about using the same phrase, and after a while, it does make you start to sort of joke. <laughs> oh. I think you should uh, pair books. Hard to find, less hard to find. Well, difficult to find, a lot easier to find. But, slightly better. Right, so we are, I've got to... Halfway through the books today. Got six more to go. Right, so. 40. Now, we are now up to, by my count, episode 6. 
Now, episode six of Four Random Books started off with possibly one of my favourite books I have, but it also is written by one of my friends, and so I have to be quite careful when I'm promoting that I don't sound like I'm just selling my friend's book. Because it's a very, very good book, and I want people to like it for because it's such a good book. But also, the author, Marcus Faulkner, is one of the nicest, me uh, nicest academics I know. One of the kindest ones I know. He is, uh, he, you know, the story I always give is, during my PhD viva, when I was in a room being cross-examined, my mum had come up to London so that there was someone there to support me. And she was waiting outside in the corridor because she'd found a seating area at King's and there wasn't much space for his seat. She didn't want to sit down in the dining hall. She wanted to be close to that. So she... And he finds her outside and he goes, Are you Mrs. Clark? Yes, I'm Alex's mum. All right then, we can't have you sitting out here. Why don't you come and join me in my office? And he gets her a cup of tea. He chats with her. So while I'm having my examination, and she was uh, had been sitting outside, worried, he takes care of her and basically looked after her for the time I was in there. And that's just one of countless examples I have of him just being a nice, thoughtful person. And I would love to say that's the rule in academia, but most people actually... They are still nice people, but they don't have the time. Their brain is not there often enough. They're off de dealing with various things that they're not actually taking notice of sometimes the things going around them. He's always there. He always gets the stuff done, but he's also very, very nice. So I always recommend, you know, if his books are good, I will always recommend them. But I do include that as sort of an admittance. Now... Oh. Right. Jack, Narvik may have proved that Warspite plot armor was force field influencing electronic detonations. Possibly. Uh, so this is the book. He's also got a World War One one and all these things, but this is Naval War Atlas, War at Sea, 1939 to 1945. Its introduction is written by Andrew Lambert, my old prof, and it is gorgeous. Okay? If you are the type of person who wants not only a map which explains what's going on in a certain campaign, but wants it beautifully annotated and described, this is the book for you. It is expensive, but there really isn't a cheaper version out there that is anywhere near as good. And it is gorgeous. It is beautifully inscribed. It's the whole war at sea, so you go anywhere in the world, you're interested in a campaign, it comes up, it has the battle, it zooms in on the battle, but it also has all these descriptions. So it's a wonderful overview of World War II. It's, if you're one of those people who wants to have a map in your eye, and he always has inscriptions of what the forces look like, and they're beautifully done, so they look actually right, and it tells you where, and not just the forces involved in the battle, but the contextual forces as well are put out there, so everything is there, and, you know, this is the German auxiliary cruisers in 1942, what they were getting up to, where they were in the world, what they were doing... It all goes into all of it. It shows you them all around the world. The Battle for Blanket Strait is detailed. The Battle of Bismarck Sea, detailed. All these things. And it's just... <sighs> Convoys HX229 and SC1212 are between the 16th and 22nd of March 1943. And the battles going on against the U-boat packs and how they're getting involved. Operation Pamphlet. January and March 1943. Where the Australian Division get transferred, or what they're providing, or what's covering what, where's going where, how's, what's their speed is, who's their scores, what the troop ships are, 
what their escort is, what the distance coverage is, what these ships are doing, it's all there. Wasn't Andrew Lambert on a couple of naval documentaries? Yes. He's been on several. He is a very good professor. Yes, there is a World War One version of it. And the thing about Marcus, you have to remember, is he can speak languages... Well, the only person I know who I would say is better is my girlfriend, who's the only one I know who knows more languages and can speak more. And they are both absolutely excellent. And I have to admit, I have managed to avoid them getting too close to each other, them actually sort of meeting each other, because I'm worried they'll spend their entire time gabbling away in multiple languages, and I won't understand a thing that's being said. Purely, I'm, I, I, I just think it's better for my, uh, for me, sort of, to keep them separate, so I don't, so I <laughs> don't lose track of the conversation, or I need to start learning languages. I have to say, with this one, I do think that C fourth didn't haven't printed enough. I hope they print more of them. I hope they do another run because it's an, a beautiful book. Faulkner speaks what languages? Um, I think it's about three or four he has that, that he's completely fluent in and others he has smatterings in. So that's Tectonics. I watch Dracula's videos instead of reading naval history books. Well, yes, but if you fancy a book as a companion to Drax, uh, uh, Drax videos, this would certainly be a good one to start. Dan Freeman, two things about Mark Faulkner's books. One, they're quite discounted on Amazon. Two, I couldn't find them on your Amazon recommendation list. I'm not sure why. I did add them in there. Rapid Race, it takes so long to put together a good atlas. It does. And he had to wander around the world and do a lot of things. Yep, made sure they are part of that. Um, I've also added in his other new book, which came out in 2019, which is called Decision Atlantic, The Young Allies and the Longest Campaign of the Second World War. New Perspectives of the Second World War. It's a really, really good book. But really, if you do want a Battle of the Atlantic Specialist, Marcus is excellent. And I would have said it, he has literally written the articles on the Grass Bay. The, the ones you have to, if you want to understand the full, he's the one who has poured over the designs, everything, and has done all that. <clears throat> mm. Mm. Sorry. <coughs> Pardon me. Do you know what I own? Would you happen to know the refit plans for Atreus Hood? I know them enough to know that Drax plans he's put forward for them in, I'm not sure if it's come out yet or if it has come out, are very, very close to what I think they would have been. In this lighting, it looks like a monstrous skull. Hmm. I'm not sure about that, but it is cool. It, it, it is a good book to look at. 
Right, next one. Right. This is Great War at Fighting the Great War at Sea, Strategy, Tactics and Technology by Norman Freeman. Basically, if you want an overview of everything, okay? I don't agree with everything he says in it because I think some bits he has skipped through a bit too quickly and some bits he has uh, drawn parallels which I'm not sure I agree with. But if you want an overview that introduces you to the Great War at Sea. And which will mean that you have a foundation from which to go in any research direction if you're interested in the First World War at Sea. So if you want a starting point, a base point to begin all other work. I love the Massey books and I would tell you to get them any time. But that's the narrative history. And that's great if you want the narrative history. But if you want all the things which inform the narrative history, okay, so narrative history tells you what happens. This is the why. Why they're thinking this way. Where that information comes from. These books. This book specifically by Norman Freeman. Um, wouldn't the Atlantic be more of a campaign? It is to an extent, but they also sometimes call it a battle to try and make the point that it's kind of overlooked. Uh, it's the, then it's like, kind of like the Battle of Britain, which is more of a campaign than a battle, but it's called the Battle of Britain, and it's called the Battle of the Atlantic sometimes when it's more of a campaign, really. Dan Freeman would like to be a relation, a relation of Norman Freeman. I think he would enjoy the the, uh, the discussions. They do have the same spellings of their names, so there could be a distant relationship. Cavalry ships. In 1914, the Royal Navy had completed about a decade in uh, the throes of a series of revolutions in capital ship design, during which the displacement and cost of battleships and battlecruisers rose by more than 60%. Battlecruisers actually came into existence, but we'll leave that to one side. With no sign of levelling off, the more or less steady design of them in the 1890s suddenly gave way to what was later called the semi dreadnoughts with intermediate calibre guns to supplement their main batteries and their secondary batteries. These weapons were adopted because it was increasingly possible to fire them as rapidly as the secondary guns. The semi dreadnoughts were abandoned partly because within a few years, main battery guns could be fired more quickly and with far greater effects. The Royal Navy led the world in these developments, suddenly producing the first of the fast battleship HMS Dreadnought in 1906. British security was effective, to the point that the rival German Navy took a considerable time to produce an inferior rival in its Nassau class. The revolution in the Royal Navy was touched off in part by a financial disaster that in the face of foreign armed cruisers, the Royal Navy had to produce its own battleship-sized armoured cruisers, often in greater size and certainly in greater numbers. That was necessary both for trade protection, the ships would occupy local areas around the world into which raiding cruisers would find themselves drawn, and to scout effectively for a battle fleet against foreign fleets which might be screened by armoured cruisers. In 1889, the Royal Navy convinced the government of the day, and as importantly the British public, political public, that the survival of British command of the sea depended on maintaining a strength equal to that of the next two navies. In 1889, these happened to be those of France and Russia, which were joining in an alliance. Thus, the two-power standard amounted to parity, plus an edge, compared to the likely enemy coalition. The disaster was that, with the advent of armoured cruisers, the Royal Navy found itself having to build an additional considerable fleet of battleship-sized ships, which had not been envisaged in the financing of the 1889 Naval Defence Act. Worse, the number of armoured cruisers was tied up not only to the number in foreign navies, but also to the need to occupy a series of stations around the world. As an example of what that meant, 
in November 1904 in connection with plans to redistribute the fleet, the stated margin was a 10% margin in battleships and a 2 to 1 margin in battleship sized armoured cruisers. Within the fleet, the armoured cruisers were essential because, in the face of enemy armoured cruisers, only they could press home reconnaissance to locate the enemy's battleships and to determine their course and speed, so the British fleet could deploy across their path. Similarly, only armoured cruisers could block an enemy's reconnaissance. Since the British had introduced modern armoured cruisers with the Cressy class, moreover, they had regarded such ships as fast second-class battleships, suitable to fight all but the best of the enemy's battleships. The main limitation of these ships was, as battleships was not, as might be imagined, armour, but rather their weak main armament, 9.2 inch rather than 12 inch guns. For example, late in 1904, when the 1905-6 programme was being sketched, it seemed that British battleship numbers were such that the next year's programme could be cut from the planned three battleships to one, which became HMS Dreadnought. However, it also seemed that next year's programme could inclu would include no fewer than five armoured cruisers of an as yet undetermined type. This figure was cut to four and then to three, the Invincible class. By this time, money was tight and the situation was worsening because there was no new source of British government income to su in sight. It is a good book. It is interesting to read. But as I said, it's something you should probably read if you want a full picture of World First World War in concert with Matthew's books. So, uh, Trek Donix, is Greyhound going to stay on an Apple Plus forever? How can I watch that movie, or is it a historic number? It's a good movie. Historically, it's got a few things in it, but honestly, I will forgive them because of the most of those reasons they've got them are because they have used museum ships, and the museum ships have things which are that, and I, I'm going to take that. It's a good movie. I haven't watched it myself, but I've now got had good reports from about four people. I don't have Apple Plus. I am hoping it comes to Amazon Prime at some point or Netflix. Do you know when I am? What's Jingles right about the way uh, how captains for big ships were chosen, i.e. based on discipline and cleanliness act? Uh, I haven't heard him say that, so I don't know the context of him saying that, but there is certainly a factor that a well-run well ship, a orderly ship, is an important thing for a captain to be chosen. Because if you consider the number of people living in close confines, if a captain doesn't keep a clean, tidy ship, then the odds are, and a first officer, is that's usually part of their job, then the odds are there's going to be disease, and that can lead to a very badly run ship, or a very unable, unavailable ship, because of disease. So, there is certainly a factor, but I wouldn't rate that as the highest factor. It's more a case of, if the ship was dirty, that would count against the officer, than if it was clean, it counts for them, if that makes sense. But, as I said, I haven't heard what Jingles has said. I've actually never spoken to Jingles, although I have listened to him on occasion and thought he was very well informed. So, um, I'd have to see the actual context of what he was saying. Newhauser, Danny Freeman, I suspect there's individual battle honours within the Battle Atlantic for some specific events, um, sinking of Bismarck, those sort of things. There are, but I can't remember there being anything within the Battle of Britain. There are some, again, within the Battle of Britain as well, but mostly the, the, it's a case that, you know, as King's Rook says, if the Battle Atlantic, Battle of Me uh, Mediterranean, and the Battle of Britain all counted for certain multiples of battle honours, in rather than single battle honours, there would be several small ships which would be better at getting more than the war spite. John Nomet, hello. I've been doing research on US naval policy and I noticed that both Parliament and Congress wanted to cut back on naval spending. How serious was the, was the mutual suspicion? Not that great. They wanted to cut back on naval spending because they wanted to save money. Um, warships are expensive, especially in the 1920s and 30s.
Benelon, hmm, seems to suggest Fisher's actions also helped to lock in future funding for the RN by forcing government to fund these new types of ships. To an extent. <laughs> Rapid Rosebeck, unless there is an actual shooting war in progress, all political bodies want to cut spending and capital ships are expensive. Yeah. Do you know one moment? I can send you a video if you want. Jingles was doing a video on HMS Hood for World Warships and he brought it up. I'd love to see it. I'll have a look at it. As I said, I haven't seen it. Um, Daniel Freeman. So, poor planning this as a place to lose points but not really gain any. Pretty much. That's how I understand it. And it's still to this day, uh, if officers, their, their areas are untidy, it's a place they'll lose points. But it won't be a case of, oh, good, this officer's a neat freak, so we'll promote them. No. It's a case of, this is clean, tidy, good. Do they run a good ship? Are the crew, are the people under command broadly happy? And you have to remember when you're... Okay. So if I'm a captain and I'm writing an appraised officer, and all these officers will get appraised as they go up, they'll get notes, notes written by senior officers the whole way through. Those senior officers will often, because they're quite clever have a quiet word with the chief petty officers as well. The chief petty officer's opinion will have some weight. So there'll be a sort of 360 review informally done. And at various stages on their career, they might well also get peer reviewed by the people around them. I, when they're midshipmen on these things, they can have some level of peer review going on. And various other officers and NCOs will get involved in rating that person as they go up. So, how do I put this? It's quite hard for someone to get to the sort of level of commanding a battleship and not be good at their job. There have been examples of it. They do happen. But it's quite hard for them to get there. It's a case of the system has failed at several points for them to happen. But do you know one on Please do post the video to Discord and have a look at it. Hmm. Thomas Warner, have you ever heard of Sebaton? No. Thanks, Serena. I'll look at it on Twitter in a bit. Right, so, now I'm going to do the partner book, uh, and you has asked, does the RN have something akin to the Battle E? Mm, not really, they kind of expect, they, they have all sorts of other things which they do but they're not really akin to ba they fulfill a similar role but they're not really the same as the battle e Right. Chronology of the War at Sea, 1939 to 1945, by Jürgen Rohr. Now, honestly, if I was going to combine two books to look at World War II, these would be it. Because this is an actual, an actual literal, day-to-day -day guide to what is going on in World War II. You can turn to any day. And you will find what else is going on. The 11th to 29th of December, South Pacific. On the 11th to 12th of November, a Japanese force of 11 destroyers, Rear Admiral Tanaka, on a resupply mission to Guadalcanal, is attacked by aircraft, though without success. It is then attacked by PT-37 and PT-40, which sink the destroyer Tenryuzuki. In return, however, Kowalski and Suzaki sink PT-40. Australian landings take place near Burma, Papua, 
and to support the Australian and American troops advancing on land, the Dutch steamship Kalsik, escorted by the corvette Lichthal, uh, brings eight armoured vehicles into Orca Bay, south of Buna, on 10th to 12th and 14th to 16th December. On the 14th of December, the corvettes Ballarat, Broome and Colac land one battalion of 662 men, and on the 19th of December, another battalion of 699 men on, uh, in Oriel Bay. On the 29th of December, the corvettes Broome, Colac and Weir transport 615 men from Goodenough Island into Oro Bay. Five Japanese destroyers bring 800 men from Rabul to Ca uh, Cape Ward Hunt, north of Burma, from 12th to 14th of December. In an attack by U.S. Air Force um, B-17 bombers on 30 November, the destroyer is an army is damaged. 12 December. Thank you, thank you Jim Crossan. Chris on. Thank you. It's always nice to get Super Chat. Dare my iron brew fund. <laughs> thank you. Uh, 12 December. English Channel. The German MDS Spare Brecker 144 Bergerland is in action with the British destroyers Whitshead. Worcester, Vesper, Brockersby, and Abington has a boiler room damaged by a torpedo fired by Witched and is finally sunk by a torpedo fired by the Norwegian destroyer Eskalder. It's all fun. But it is a very, very good book, Chronology of the War at Sea by Jürgen Rohr. And I do think that. I'm just checking. Well, a version of it is currently still at, uh, kill, uh, still available. Um, not that much, actually. There's a hardcover version. The one, this one isn't available, but there's a hardcover version uh, available on Amazon for £5. 1943 to 45, though, not the full edition. This is the full edition. It's a good book. You get, a, you get a good captain or a good first officer balancing each other out. Sometimes very lucky or unlucky. This is a good from other ranks point of view. Yeah. Seth Thompson, has Dr. Clark, has a captain ever messed up enough to go from a battleship to a trawler? No. If you messed up enough on a battleship, you get kicked out of the Navy. Um, there have been officers who've gone from destroyers in World War One, reserve time in well in the interwar period, and then uh, trawlers in World War Two. But that's hardly a sort of demotion. That's a thing on it. Surf, uh, surf track torrent. Bismarck, the most unlucky ship of World War II, with the string bag torpedo ha hitting the rudder after a sawfish squadron attacked a British ship with the wrong warhead turning. Or other ships like. There are lots of ships which are unlucky and lucky in World War II. Uh, there are lots of lucky hits which are, are scored in World War II, but mostly those lucky hits, to an extent, are they're focusing enough on those areas that they're going to. they could get lucky. Rapid Razor. I'm not sure I've ever thought about this, but was there a surge in U-boat deployments, and was the RN aware of it at the time? Yes, there were several surges, and the RN was always very, very aware of it when it happened. Right, I'll be back in a second. Just iron brew, and, well, you know, what goes in must come out. Ow! Got to stop doing that to myself. Got to stop doing that.
Hello, I'm back. Hey. Right. Cost Ranch, recall when the USN XO got kicked out because he made videos that were um, inappropriate. Yeah. <clears throat> uh, Sergeant, don't talk about sure how, how the rundown ladder would play out. Thanks for clearing it out. Pleasure. Do you think one of the reasons historical books don't sell as well because, aside from having a limited audience, many cover the same topics? Um, see, some historical books do sell well. I think the trouble is there is often a gap in that some historical books are written for a very small audience, and they're written in a way that does it. And some of the books are written for a very large audience, but they're not actually full of new information. They're just a recycling of what's already been covered. And I consider the most popular historian, uh, naval historians and historians who tend to write them, are the ones who tend to write things which are both full of new information and written for a popular audience in a way that people can understand them. So, for example, and I hope this is the case because I very much tried it for it to be the case with my book on tribals, battles, and daring's, that it would be both suitable for a general re audience to read and have the information level in it necessary for an academic to read it and find it useful. So it has the academic level of information and referencing, but it's written in a style which is approachable. And it was kind of difficult to juggle within the word count, and I won't know if I've succeeded until other people read it. Angus Sonner, why is Dr. Clark so pain today? Well, um... Yeah, I twi managed to twist my ankle. Basically, I am. Um, if I'm doing something dangerous, I'm fine. If I'm just walking around my house, or in this case, was walking outside, out the house to walk the dog, apparently I managed to hurt myself. Rapid raise back. If you keep talking to yourself off camera, people start to ask questions. Usually, I talk to myself when I've done something stupid. It's just, it, there is all. I have got another T-shirt somewhere around here which says, "Of course, I talk to myself." Sometimes I need expert advice. Sometimes I need someone who knows me well to tell me off when I'm being an idiot. So that's what I do. I tell myself off. It also stops other people having to tell me off because I've done it to myself. Do you know what? Unlucky ships World War Two. Hood, Bismarck, Nice and out. William Deport. Walter, Luca, every ship in Mosul Kabir, the poor IGN cruiser who had star shells shot at it at Laity Gulf. Possibly. Lucky ships in World War II. HMS Eskimo. HMS Ashanti. Uh, the Poe side. Not naval, I know, but what is your opinion on Anthony Beaver? He's a good starting point. Ben Laura. Tom Holland is good for this classical history. Yeah. New Hours S. Come on, readability is in your job. That's your editor's job. Ah. Uh, we always hope it... No, no. I love my editors, but no, I wouldn't trust them to, to tell me readability. They are very, very nice people. That's They're, they're never going to tell me, uh, tell me that one. And the editors know far too much about the subject. That's the trouble. The editors also know the topic. Because they've read the versions of it, and you've talked about it with them. King's Rock. When doing something dangerous, you pay attention. When you'll get complacent, it's when problems happen. Yep. Any examples behind, beside your attempt? I would say Marcus Faulkner's book is a good one. I would say Andrew Lambert's Admirals is a good one. I would say Trevor Royal's book is a good one. I would say Narvik is a good one by Donald McIntyre. I would say Command of the Ocean by Nicholas, uh, Nicholas Rogers is a good one. And I'd say I've got... Two good ones and an interesting one to go in the rest of the books today.
Mm-hmm. There's a few officers, uh, uh, Niaz S, Gross Arts, it really depends. There's a few officers who are really able to straddle both. And those are, I hope, going to grow in number. Because I think it's important it does. Right then. So we're at 2 hours and 18 minutes, roughly. So I will do... The end of this, edit and put because we're starting at the two hours and eighteen mark. Here's a good one, which does it. Major General Julian Thompson, Dunkirk, retreat to victory. And let me give you an example of this. Although the German High Command and Army Group commanders had recovered from the temporary fright they had experienced at Arras, and fears of an Allied breakthrough from the North had subsided, they now had enough matter to occupy their minds. They, and Rundstedt especially, were turning their minds to the next phase in the campaign, the forthcoming operations to be undertaken after the Allies in the North had been disposed of, the culmination of Operation Yellow, the Sickle Cut, which could only be a matter of days. They were preoccupied by the need to refurbish their armour and all the myriad preparations for the second phase, swimming from 90, through 90 degrees and smashing the French army south of the Somme, Operation Red. Increasing preoccupation of Operation Red explains much of the German conduct of the campaign in the north from 23rd of May onwards. BF's deployment on the frontier involved four divisions. I Corps on the right with 1st and 42nd Divisions. Two Corps on the left with 3rd and 4th Divisions. Brooke had handed back 1st Division to 1st Corps and reassumed command of 4th Division on the 23rd of May. Meanwhile, the 2nd and 48th Divisions were to be prepared to defend the Canal Line and assemble southwest of Lille for this purpose. The 44th Division uh, was to be held in General Headquarters Reserve, while the 5th and 50th Divisions were as Frank Force holding the RS Salant. As the threat to the Canal Line increased, the 2nd and 48th Divisions were each ordered to provide a small force consisting of artillery, machine guns and infantry to move in advance of divisional main bodies to hold the threatened sectors. These were X-Force, commanded by Brigadier Lawson, CRA, 48th Division, and Y-Force, commanded by Brigadier Friendly, CRA, 2nd Division. Since Weygaard's visit uh, to the north, followed by the Vincennes meeting, the issue of Weygaard's Order No. 1 and Church's Directive, Gort had experienced a mounting sense of frustration. He simply could not see how the northern armies could mount a counterattack by eight divisions, by 23rd of May, the whole of the French 1st Army totaled 8 divisions plus elements of the Cavalry Corps. The Belgians could produce nothing. His own reserve of 2 divisions was fighting hard around the Ras. By the morning of the 23rd of May, the day set for Weygaard's great counter-attack, Gort had not received any orders and there was no sign of coordination. So he sent a telegram to the Secretary of State for War, Anthony Eden, saying that coordination was essential and asking that General Dill, the v uh, VCIGS, be sent out to assess the situation on the ground. He added, My view is that any advance by us will be in the nature of a sortie, and relief must come from the south as we have not yet, repeat, not ammunition for a serious attack. Blanchard turned up at Gort's HQ that morning and agreed with his judgment, but Gort, without knowing what the plans were for the attack from the south, suggested a northern attack should be by two British divisions, where these were to come from at the time, he said, uh, he, time he said is a, it is a mystery, plus one French division and what remained of the French Cavalry Corps, and that it should be mounted on the 26th of May. This was the earliest possible date given of moves and release currently being carried out by formations of BFF. Churchill's reaction to Gort's telegram to Eden was to demand that Reim, uh, Reynard issue orders to French commanders in north and south to the Belgians to carry out the counterstroke immediately. Time was vital and the supplies were short. Although not responding in full to Gort's request, Churchill was beginning to have his doubts about Weygaard's grandiose schemes in particular, and about the French ability in general to pull off any sort of counterblow. 
By the evening of the 23rd of May, as no orders had been received by Gort, Churchill fired off another telegram to Reynard, in effect asking him to lean on Weygaard to produce some action, and repeating Gort's view that the main effort had to come from the south because the BF had insufficient ammunition for a major attack. He added that Gort was still obliged to implement the agreed plan. Far more encouraging was the telegram Gort received from Eden, also on 21 May. Should, however, the situation on your line of communication make this Vega plan at any time impossible, you should inform us so we can inform the French and make naval air arrangements to assist you should you have to withdraw it on the northern coast. This is a good book. Website, I don't know how much you read, but would you consider doing a discussion on historical fiction? I have done a few in the past, and I'll do it again. I do read a lot. Then, Laura, chat quick query. Have we done the patron question for next month or not? Uh, no, there are two. Uh, no, I haven't done them yet. I'm going to reveal them in a shortly. I've got the patron questions sorted out. I do know what's won. I was going to do it at the end of the books. I know I do sometimes do it at the beginning, but today I felt like doing it at the end. I'll just make sure that's all open. Nick Waters, are we going to describe Zubin as very lucky or very unlucky? Well, she was First World War, so, you know. Lucky Ships of World War Two by Juno 101. Warspite, Belfast, Big E, Eskimo, Shan Horse, Prince Jürgen. Shan Horse gets sunk at the end. Um, Warspite again, USS Laffrey. USS Haida, <laughs> oh, and Warspite. Yeah. Ashanti was blessed. That is the thing. She wasn't lucky, she was blessed. Rapid noise back. Who voices who of the audio book of your uh, audio book of your book of your book has an ensemble class? Um, I get various academic colleagues, bilge pumps colleagues, to take over various roles. Rapid noise back. How would the naval history read differently if told from the point of view of the ships doing the talking? Oh, that would be cool. To be honest, that would be cool. I do talk about the ships quite a lot as if they are humans. That is one of my things that gets me into trouble occasionally with my editors, because they're going, the ship is a ship, it's not another human being. And I go, it has a character. Right then, so, next one. Right then, so the next one I have is this one. Dunkirk, Forgotten Vices. Oh, voices. It's written by Joshua Levine, or compiled by him, and 
here's the thing. Captain Peter Barley, 2nd Battalion, Royal Norfolk Regiment. With the heroic display of his and the good work done by the rest of Sergeant Major Grislock's tiny party, the two enemy groups that had crossed the canal were disposed of. Then the reserve company of my own battalion came up and made good of the right flank. I think I passed out there, and the next thing I remember was in a third a first aid post with Gristock, who was in a very bad state. But not so bad that he didn't appreciate some jellified brandy pills that we were given. They had cheered him up no end. They were delicious and very well, uh, very welcome. From there on, I was investigated, and so was Gristock. I was ev evacuated from a first aid post to a larger medical rendezvous. I had a darling little black mongrel dog who wouldn't leave me, and she was lying on me, preventing anybody getting near me. They cut off my trousers, which I thought was the most awful waste of reason pair of battle dress trousers. And my little dog was so concerned about this that they had to put a bag over her and take her away. I never saw her again. It was too awful. Four of us were put into a tradesman van, and we'd gone some little distance when the driver brought the vehicle to a very abrupt halt and turned the van around unceremoniously. The van had opened back, and I found myself looking at a German tank sitting about 20 yards away in the middle of the road. We had red cross painted on the side of the van, and the chap forbore to fire at us, so we went on our way until we reached the station where the stretcher cases were loaded onto a hospital train. Jellified brandy pills, yes. Rapid Razor, Bale, what are these books? Dunkirk. New IKB4472, just because you can't prove the ship has fought of feelings doesn't mean they don't count. That's my view. And they have so much electronics in them now, and so much other things, you know, they have personality. But it's a good book. And... I have to say, I'm sad about the number of dogs which get left behind, honestly. Because when I sort of read about these little dogs, I always think about my own dogs I've had over the years, and it, it makes me sad that dogs get, you know, because dogs are always such nice creatures, and they get completely ripped up in war. They lose all the sort of their, their families and those things. It just seems cruel. Sarah Thompson, I apologise to my truck when I'm about to do something questionable with it. Yeah, I have a Subaru I apologise to when I'm about to do something questionable to it. And, you know, in fact, her name is Naid. She's named for a World War II Royal Navy cruiser. My previous vehicles were all named for various World War II battleships, but um, as she's a Subaru and she didn't feel like she should have a battleship name, she felt more like a cruiser. Made fit the colour. So this is a book I liked so much I have multiple copies of it. Either they've been bought for me or I've bought them myself. I'm kind of quite sure. Um, I think actually at least one copy was bought for me by my mum, but I have about three or four of them. Robert Jackson's Dunkirk, The British Evacuation, 1940. And it's just a good book. It was originally published in 1976. This version, well, the paper, Castle Paperback Edition was published in 2002 first, but this version is actually from their reprint in 2004. And it's just well written. The North Staffords were the first to cross the start line at 2100, followed by the Grenadiers 20 minutes later. The two battalions advanced separately in the dusk, there was no contact between them, and indeed, there had been no time to work out anything but a sketchy plan for coordination. Surprisingly enough, the advance went better than anyone had anticipated. Moving along either side of the Messines roads on the left, the North Staffords encountered only light opposition for the first mile, and this mainly from groups of Germans who had infiltrated. As they pressed on, however, the troops met increasingly heavy mortar and small arms fire. Just before midnight, the spearhead of the battalion reached the Cortenkir, 
where it relieves some hard-pressed Royal Warwicks of 143rd Brigade, and at this point Butterworth decided to consolidate ground he had won. The Grenadiers, meanwhile, had moved up towards Comines on the left of the railway line that led to the town. After advancing for half an hour, meeting only slight opposition from isolated enemy groups, they heard sounds of battle ahead and increased their pace. As they topped the slight rise, they saw a confusion of figures in distance moving in the glare of burning farming buildings. It was the Black Watch and the Royal Engineers, fighting hard at the limit of their advance. Among them, like crawling beetles, the light tanks of the 13th and 18th Hussars darted streams of glittering tracer at the enemy positions. The Grenadiers, quickly joining up with the others and charged with the bayonet, driving out the remaining Germans. The cost of the British had been high, but by midnight, most of the enemy had been cleared from the west bank of the canal and the threatened right flank secured. During the Wishati Ridge, which had been seen of the better fighting during the earlier war, some time later, units of General Montgomery's 3rd Division also began to arrive in the battle area, passing, extending the front along the Yeza Canal to the north of Yip. The 3rd Division's move was highly complicated by congestion on the roads, and for the sake of rapid movement, the divisional artillery was ordered to disable and abandon its medium guns. It was now that the high standard of training among Montgomery's men paid division uh, dividends. The move was successfully completed in, con in conditions of pitch darkness and pouring rain, with both British and German artillery shells screeching overhead, and the division's 8th and 9th brigades were established in line by 10, uh, 10 o'clock on 20th of May. Franklin had planned to make a counterattack with the help of the 4th Division's 10th Brigade on the morning of the 28th of May, but before this could be carried out, the German 18th Division launched a heavy assault on the sector of the line, held by the Grenadiers and North Staffords, and although both battalions managed to hold on, they suffered more casualties than they had sustained during the counterattack on the previous evening. Heavy attacks also fell on Brigadier Dempsey's 13th Brigade, but the British held on here with great determination and gave the enemy a hard beating. A subsequent counterattack by the 10th Brigade sealed off the holes torn by the infl infiltration of the German attackers, and by nightfall on the 28th, the British line was fairly secure once more. At this point, however, all officers of company commander level learned that the evacuation of the British Expeditionary Force had begun. Only now was it fully realised to what extent the salvation of BAF had depended on the gallant two-day defence of the East Corps line. It was also clear that following the hammer blow of the Belgian army surrender, the line would rapidly become untenable as the enemy spread or speared around its left flank. At 2200 hours, on the 28th, orders were accordingly issued for the units in the line to begin a gradual withdrawal, with the 3rd and 50th Division swinging back northwestwards from the Isar Canal and Ypres to form a new line from Porangi to Norstadt, blowing bridges over the Isar as they went. This was carried out early, only just in time. Minutes after the last bridge had been blown, a mass of German motorised infantry was seen pouring into Dixmund on the other side of the Isar. Had they captured the bridges intact, they would have been in a position to thrust straight onto Newport on the coast, threatening the Dunkirk bridgehead from the northeast. This is a good book. Uh, who knows? That's up to uh, it, the post side. Is there a possibility of ordering a book? I would totally pay for that despite ordering it today. I'm not sure. I, I've been chatting with, uh, with Seaforth and Pen and Sword and we'll see. King's Rook, Romy is the best ship with character. Yeah, I would have to agree that she is the better one. Rabbit <laughs> when ships develop computers with personalities, the books about the ships will be written by the ships themselves. Probably. <laughs> oh. Ah, she's a good, she's a good cop, but this is a good book, and it was only seven ninety nine when new in the UK, nine dollars ninety five when new in the US, and fourteen dollars ninety five in Canada. Seriously, Canada, why are your books so expensive? Every time, the largest figure on there is the Canadian one. Is there inflation going on? Is there a high exchange rate? What's happening, Canada, to your books? Do you have more tax on them? It's cruel. Take care, joining us.
King's Rook, because of inflation, high exchange rate. Yeah. So you have all done it to me again, and I'm going to read through the patron votes. Now, we have on eight votes each, so in joint fourth place, we have Lessons of the Battle of Guadalcanal from Daniel Freeman, and what's the impact of India if the RN lands Marines and Uri takes Narvik, uh, Narvik and eventually the Allies save Norway, courtesy of Timothy Sims. On 10 votes, add in third place, we have withdrawal from east of Suez, 1966, reactions, short and long-term implications for the Royal Navy. On joint second place, we have the effect of the early jet age on how it affected naval warfare, strategy and tactics, courtesy of Andrenor. And the Battle of Slees is Major General J.F.C. Fuller correct to declare it one of the Western world's decisive battles, courtesy of Berlinero. And winning for a second time, so I'm sure it's not rigged, but we go with the name, Trent Affair gone hot. How badly would the US Navy have had its uh, butt beat? Courtesy of the CIA. I am sure the CIA is not rigging the vote. But they got 12 votes. So, 60 votes in total out of 64 patrons who could all vote as many times as they liked. So, theoretically, we could have had a 64 votes cast, 60 votes cast out of a potential 320. So, that they, that list made you as, as mm, unsure as I did, because they were all very good. But also, I've now got to work out how I'm going to get free patron videos into November. I'm thinking long patrols are coming up. Stafford Johnson. Okay, that last reading made my head perk up so many times to North Stafford. So if I ever make it to the home aisles, I'll have to have very proper outfits. Um, the Staffordshire regiments um, were some of the most... Some of the bravest regiments the British Army had in World War II. I've got the title Staffordshire. They do a lot of very, very good work. And their nickname, they are always, always shortened down to Stafford. This book goes into them a lot. There are a few other books about them. They are some regiments which have a very storied history. So if you're interested in Stafford Thompson, do go look them up. You'll find it cool. Calm Gasford, I don't know where your ship learned to communicate. C3PO on Millennium Falcon. Yeah. Surf Track Primates. Canada has free health care for everything. Tax goods to pay for it. The UK has the NHS. We're still... Lower down on that cost thing. <laughs> Seth Thompson, is my name come back across the pond, or as odd as it is here? As it seems to come up a bit in, back in England. It's more common in a sort of 1920s, 1930s, and def up to 1950s. Stafford was quite common, uh, was partially a common name, so you know. <laughs> oh. Very, a far more common surname these days, as Nick Waters points out. Uh, ben Lai, if you want a copy of the Fuller for the video, I would happily send mine if you want. I think I have a copy of Fuller. 
I do have one somewhere. I have a copy of Fuller. Don't worry about that one. I'll have to dig it out, but I have it somewhere. Dr. Mark, may I ask how good the Welsh regiments are? Royal Welsh and South Wales borders have family attachments. They do very well as well. Right, so, we have Iron Brew left. Let the question and answer section begin. The Perp side. Read free Patreon videos. Take care of yourself. We don't need your videos. We just enjoy them. <laughs> no, I will get them, uh, get them done. Don't worry. And I enjoy them. As I've said many times, and I do put myself under a bit of pressure because I want to get it done. And there's got the book has other things coming up. I've just had the proofs back for the first couple of chapters to check through. And there's some things I'd like to make some changes and that sort of thing. In. But I like doing these videos because... There's two reasons. One, I really love talking with all of you about naval history, and I love sharing the passion for naval history and doing these sort of things. And two, and this is the part of me which is now sort of waking up to it and thinking about it and approaching this far more seriously than possibly I began it as. I have again, for about the third year in a row had the joy of university deciding they're going to rewrite when they're paying me and that sounds really strange to say but let's put it as the last summer has been kind of interesting so what universities tend to do with early career researchers like me is they pay us in advance for our summer hours and then they can cut our contracts so we're only employed 10 months a year which saves them money overall the deal was supposed to be, with all the extra hours they were asking me to do, in terms of one university particularly, over the extra and because of COVID and all the scenarios that brought up, that I was going to be able to put in my timesheet in September and therefore get paid at the end of October. Put in my timesheets in September. They got rejected because the way they've attached, they've created my contract they can't pay me for anything work is put on a timesheet before October. Which means I'm still owed money. And I'm not going to get paid till the end of November. And I find that annoying. But that means, it's going to sound strange, but that means the patron money for books is really important for me keeping my research going. Basically, without the Patreon money, I couldn't afford to keep doing my research, especially as I haven't been able to get into the National Archives, and I can't really go to libraries, etc., because I live with shielded people, so I have to be very circumspect on what I do. It's one of the reasons why I picked where me and my girlfriend did go for holiday, uh, for a holiday, centre parks, because it's very easy to isolate yourself off. You're in a little lodge, it's a secure area, people can't get on or out without mission and you've got a large area to go cycling around and if you want to you can be like us and ignore everyone else for the entire time you're there and just have some fun which is what we did lots and lots of cycling and that's what i'm saying so basically the patron money the youtube money that's coming in well they're the way I'm keeping my research going. Without them, I wouldn't be able to do my research. If I wasn't able to do my research, then there would be a gap in my publication history and all this, the working history. So my applying for proper full time permanent lecturing posts would actually have me explaining stuff which would put me at a huge disadvantage when I go for those jobs. Plus, to an extent, I'm using the YouTube videos as a bit of a publication supplement to go, look, I am doing this work. So I am trying to more professionalize and make sure it's more regular and make sure I'm delivering on time when I, when I promise these things they're delivered. But there are now lots of reasons which govern my involvement in YouTube. And honestly, there is part of me, because I have this conversation with Drac and I have this conversation with Jamie quite a lot when we're doing bilge pumps. And for all three of us, to an extent, we would love to reach a, there is part of us which would really love to reach a scenario where 
our money from YouTube and our money from Patreon, uh, sort of money from YouTube or Patreon and books and other things we're doing was enough that we weren't dependent upon the vagrancies of other people paying us because with some of the companies it's really interesting the private sector companies I work for pay up on time every single time I can rely on them if they say they're going to pay on a certain date they'll pay on a certain date but the universities I work for which make up a majority of my working life that these are these big government funded organizations in many respects have all this money from students and everything else coming through if anyone's going to rewrite my paycheck and not pay me it's going to be them in fact one university owes me for some region of over the last two and a half years due to their various pay systems they now owe me for 120 something hours and they are supposed to be working out how to pay me back but seeing as they're not even paying me for the hours i'm actually working at the moment they seem to be sort of they pay me enough that i can't really afford to stop working for them but they don't pay me for full amount by any stretch of the imagination but that's enough on that that's rather a boring topic and thank you to Plebiscide. And I'll I'll probably factor in the free videos in a way that sort of somehow... I'll probably take out one of the videos I was going to put in myself in the, that period in November. That's probably the easiest way. Carl Harman, I know someone in my family served in Burma and there's a mountain named after him. Uh, my hometown, Tregar. Uh, so lots of people from there died. There also Rear Guard Gun Dunkirk. One VC, any tips for? Looking up. Um, I would say if I was going to finding who won it. I would say look, find up the regimental regiment and look up the regimental records. That would be the easiest way. The regimental records in the National Archives are usually the best way to track down these things. Things are because the Canadian economy is so geared towards export, especially the U.S. Having a high exchange rate, especially with the U.S., benefits the exporters. Hmm. Danny Freeman, I have a big question. Well, the answer may be big. If I saw a salt book by Lovering, intro, in, intro by Lind, page room edition, this is seven books to read. Can you summarise them, please? I can. But I'm going to get it out to make sure I get the seven right. Yeah. See, the thing is, people think that there are all these books around me. I don't know where they are. I know where they all are. It's sometimes getting to them. This is it. I am Brufun. Thank you, Alistair Crook. Ryan. <laughs> okay. Da -da 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 Darren. Intro by Lind. Page three of my edition. Intro by Lind. And da -da 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 -da. Introduction. Enlargements. Introduction of Home Salts to Sea, page 3. Well, my version um, is page 12, but it has a lot more than free. It's got Thompson, Major General Julian, to Royal Marines from the Sea, Soldiers to a Special Force, is a very good one. And uh, that's 2000 published, then it's pretty much uh, Julian Thompson's obus to the Royal Marines. By Sea and Land, the Royal Marines, yeah, they're all... There isn't any real good bad book on here. 
The doctrinal official publications one is... Hmm? And if I was going to get any again, which I don't already have, and I already have about six of them, I would say Lad, James D. Assault from the Sea, 1939-1945, The Craft, The Landings, The Men, David and Charles, published in 1976, and uh, Bernard Ferguson's The Watery Maze, The Story of Combined Operations, published by Collins in 1961. Both of those are absolutely excellent. There's also Colonel Evans, um, Amphibious Operations and Projection of Sea Power Ashore, published by Brassies in 1990. Which is also good, but, you know. And uh, that's from this book. Thank you very much. Um, okay. Jerusalem, not many people have gone back to unions here, especially as many employers will not pay a full rate tuition fee for something that's delivered online. Actually, the thing is, the universities I work for are all oversubscribed and have more students than they've ever had before. This is one of the reasons why they're employing me. Uh, customers, how open are you to teaching overseas? I have... To be honest, I have been asked to do it a few times and have been offered posts, but I haven't accepted it because my family have been ill. And so I haven't gone. But I have been off a post in Australia and America in my time. And I don't mind going for trips. So, does YouTube or Patreon take less of a cut? Things might be picking up at work next month. Look, it's not... I'm not... That wasn't me begging for money. That was me explaining one of the reasons why I take YouTube more seriously these days. Because I'm not... Whilst I'm not in it for the money, it is it has become an important part of my income in order to keep my research going. So that's the thing. It's it's all it, without this money, I couldn't keep my research going. That's basically it. I could survive. I could feed myself, clothe myself, those sort of things. Because I getting I'm getting for enough money for that, and I can necessarily push it and live off the credit card for a bit. But I couldn't keep my research up, and so that's my it's my way of thanking you all for all you do anything, and thank you to everyone who has donated to the Iron Brew Fund tonight. It's always very kind of you. Yeah. That's the one. I have mine open next to me. You have yours open. This is a very good book if, if you don't have it. It's Tristan Lovering's Amphibious Assault. It is basically the guide to amphibious warfare. Um, not many people have their copy signed by Michael Clapp, but mine is. <laughs> because he, gave, he got given a load of free copies, so he gave me one. <laughs> <laughs> and I asked him to sign it. Oh. Oh. Hey, Goros. Right then. Go to uh, a free legal service if they have one, usually run by law students and lecturers. If I'm sure they would love writing letters to you on behalf. That's what. Um, I have gone to them. The trouble is. Because I'm neither fish nor fowl, I'm not a tenured lecturer, and I'm no longer a PhD student, because, of course, I'm an early career researcher, a contract lecturer, and technically the university says, well, we've done the right thing because we've renewed your contract. We've just repeated the contract from previous year, which means we can't pay you in September now. And I went, but you've, I've got emails you said you were going to pay me in September, and they went, oh, we've... Uh, and it's just... I've had this fight with them before, and it's had lawyers involved, and I still don't get, end up getting paid till the end of November, so... Uh, it's just annoying. And it's the fact that every year they claim it's not going to happen, that every year they're going to sort it out, and it doesn't happen, and it's... It's even more annoying for those friends of mine who work with me, who I know don't ha have to pay rent. And I'm lucky because I pay money towards the home but when I don't when my income drops my mum goes basically no you don't have to pay which is one of the reasons why I'm still at home trying to save up money to move out and eventually get a get place is because I keep having my savings wiped out because the universities keep forgetting to pay me but that's life I will sort it out I will get it through and hopefully as I said books come out so a book comes out soon there'll be more books following that YouTube, 
all these things coming through and hopefully that provides me a base level income I can start really saving and can start putting more towards research and get the research out there and then break free a bit from the university short-term contract system The plebiscite, uh, where do Conway's come, uh, Conway's come in the Jane's Brassies line? Um, I'd go Brassies, Jane's, Conway's. But Conway's sometimes jump up and down, depending on what they're doing. Uh, Carmen, maybe take the uni to employment tribunal for missing wages if you can provide proof that they might get you the money you owed. Danny Freeman, I have a massive envoy of the, uh, of the Michael Clapp autograph. Yeah, I know. I, I possibly showed it to Drac and Jamie, and they might have been the massive envy as well. <laughs> That's a unrelated to current topic, but the one guy at the desk talking format has given me the confidence to start live streaming my home baking sessions, which have been a lot of fun. I'm glad, and please send me a link. I'll have a look at them. I like to bake. I'm not as good. I'm not as good or confident enough to start live streaming it, but I do like to bake as well. So I'd enjoy what I, I'd enjoy to see that. I like, I'm trying to work on perfecting a quintuple layer chocolate cake. Rab Razor, my, you have vastly broadened my maritime education. My wife has accused me of having an affair, but thank you. <laughs> have we ever made you want to do more research or something? Yes, I have done. I've got a list thanks to doing all this stuff. Because I get to go wander around topics far more often, you know. Um... That's the thing. With this one, I get to wander topics and go, what do I fancy doing this month? What do I fancy doing at all? And the patron stuff is quite cool because it gives me it's someone else coming up with ideas of what they'd like me to do. The Pope side, what's your next book? It's an edited volume which I'm working on with my girlfriend, which is... And actually, my girlfriend could hopefully soon be coming on... Um, bilge pumps to talk about her PhD research but we are working on an edited volume based on the conference we were sorted out uh, we did off for the 37th anniversary of the Falklands War Falklands Malvinas War because and the reason I say that is because we had veterans and academics and everyone from both sides and when you're talking about a war it's like when I'm talking about the World War II to a, to a Russian audience, uh, audience, I will call it the Great Patriotic War. When I'm talking about the 1982 war to an Argentinian audience, they would call it the Malvinas War. When I'm talking to a British audience, it's the Falklands War. I would personally call it the Falklands War, but if I'm doing a conference, I would call it the Falklands Malvinas War, because I want both sides to come along. And that's why we've, how we've arranged our book and all we're uh, sort of working on. So there's that, and then after that, I'm hoping my aircraft, uh, an aircraft carrier naval aviation book, will come out based on my PhD thesis. And then after that, a uh, sloops one, and then after that, a Henderson one, which is either going to be written entirely by me, or possibly it's going to be a joint work with Drac, because he keeps flirting with the idea of wanting to get involved in that one. How do you have the energy to do this? I can barely move after doing my works research. I'm a natural workaholic. <laughs> I don't It usually depends on the subject. Usually about 120 pounds to 130 pounds a day before tax. Mm, depends on qualifications and what they're doing. I occasionally work for a company called um, Justin Craig. I work for them a lot, doing interve A level interventions and being a course director. And yeah, let's put it this way. Uh, that that's a very nice company. Unfortunately, that the work for them was all cancelled because of COVID. Otherwise, at the moment, I could be honestly be telling the um, university where to go, wander itself, and say I'm not going to work then till October. Till I said I wouldn't have worked. 
And because I'd have had that much money behind me, I could say, well, I won't work till the contract begins to pay me. But, you know, they're a very nice company to work for. I highly recommend Justin Craig. They are a lovely revision firm. Uh, Sinrak, since we don't have any more books to go, could you explain the iron system for ship designations by letter? I literally can't find anything or any info online. Well, that's because, honestly, before you get into the NATO prefix era, the Royal Navy keeps changing them around to try and uh, make sure the enemy don't know who's what. For example, things change from F to G to E all, all over the place. There's Ds, there's all sorts of things appearing. At a certain point when NATO comes in, you standardize on D for destroyer, F for frigate, C for cruiser, sort of, sort of, R for aircraft carrier, sort of, and I say sort of because there are times when they're talking about them having other things, because at a certain point, there were certain ships which referred to as through deck cruisers. So, uh, yeah, um... Basically, that would be an entire video in of itself explaining that, and I might actually do that at some point, because that would be quite fun to do. But that's the quick explanation. The proper detailed one would take its own video. Campfires are fun, Carl Harmon. I, um, again, with Justin Craig, I tend to run a centre in one of the summer schools, where I do do a whole campfire, and... I do popcorn over the campfire and marshmallows and everything. And if you've never tried cooking uh, cooking popcorn over campfire, it can go one of two ways. It can be perfect or it can be burnt solid. And literally the difference is half a second, I swear. But as long as you have enough popcorn and enough uh, two big pots, so that if one is but does go wrong, you can quickly produce another one, it's fine. But the trick of what you do is you put it over the fire, make sure you're heating the oil up, chuck in a couple of pieces of popcorn, and just listen to them to be popped. And when they go tung tung, you know that that's when the fat is hot enough. And then you pour it in. Um, it's fun doing it with vegetable fat because uh, some people are allergic to this stuff or that stuff, and you have to be very careful what you're doing with it, so you end up doing vegetable fat once or twice. That's interesting. That makes it even more susceptible to turning into burnt things. But I have managed to, and you get the kids get this huge pot of popcorn. And I mean, I've had a pot literally as big as this stack of books, big wide steel pot and full to the brim of popcorn for 50 kids to enjoy while there's London twinkling in the distance, there's stars up above, nice roaring fire, and I'm telling ghost stories. It's a fun evening for the kids, and it's usually what we do it towards the, uh, basically the last night of the course, for the, day, the night before they go home. And um, yeah, it's a fun thing to do. Raphael, what's her PhD? Uh, my girlfriend is the expert, as far as I'm concerned, as far as pretty much anyone should be concerned, on the Falklands Malvinas War and how it was, um, how the media was managed on both sides, and whether or not there was dissent in the media on both sides. And frankly, when you listen to her talk, you realise the Falklands War is the first real modern information war. No one just, just no one realised it yet. And frankly, the stuff she gets into is amazing. Mm -hmm. Um, Scott, Doug Clark, there was a sub-brief video on the maintenance and the readiness of the US Navy, or lack thereof, because of constant deployments. What is the iron situation? Is there a public report? There is a constant update provided by the Save the Royal Navy website, or at Navy Lookout on Twitter. And the Royal Navy is doing quite well, man. They did have a lowdown, but they've been building up 
steadily because they want the centre for a lot of suffering refit so it's coming out looking good and available now for the first deployment of the Queen Elizabeth class on around the world. So when HMS Queen Elizabeth goes around the world on her introduction to the world and then followed by HMS Prince of Wales will probably do a similar thing around the world as a sort of introduction. Royal Navy has two carriers um, sort of thing. They have a good task group with them. Ask her, don't have anything on YouTube yet. Their Facebook Live. Same name as here. Oh, cool. I'll have a look through. Rapid Razorback, can you get work editing? Uh, yes, but if I do the editing work, that doesn't count towards my academics. And I've, I've done it in the past. Um, I've done it a few times, but it's better for me to be actually financially longer term. It's better for me to take the hit now and be working on publishing. Oh, and Dr. Lark, the outdoor stuff is my thing. I've been doing it for eight years. I'm looking to possibly work a summer camp in a year or two, get some money if museums lay me off. All good. Um, what was it? Uh, the Oxbridge Academic Program do a very good summer camp, international summer camps. Stuff Thompson, going from BCG, DDG, SRS, MG, a modern Dutch trawler and narrowboat. Uh, would you say my hobby of this is coming along well? Very well. King's Rook, speaking of Save the Royal Navy, a couple of RCN ships have appeared in their vids in the past couple of days. Yes, the RCN is getting involved. Dev Squad, didn't HMS Prince of Wales have a serious flood recently? Uh, yes, she had a flood, but it wasn't that serious, honestly, in the role of things. Yes, it's not good to have flood water in. Yes, it's not good for water to come into side a ship. But they've got seals, they've got all sorts of things, and these things sometimes get worn out, especially when they're doing the testing and things as they get used to the systems. Rapper Razorback, sounds like she could provide a unique perspective on propaganda. Yep, that's what we're hoping to have her on for. Plus, she's very, very smart, so she will school us all. Uh, Dirt Squad, and, uh, as Nick Water says, let, let me guess, the prop shaft saying is cute? No, as Dirt Squad said, um, water pipe flooded the engineering spaces to a depth of several feet. Yes, it was lower, uh, some of the lower engineering spaces, and they were flooded to quite a lot of water, but again, to an extent, it's better these things happen now early in the career when they can be fixed, and then later at the career at sea. Death Squad, I can't say how many planes were used, but I counted them all out, and I counted them all back in again. That's always fun. That's awesome. Thank you, Doctor. Always good to double check, and happy you're not surprised. Haven't heard from back from the 12th Doctor yet, but she's probably busy with her stuff. Mm. She's usually pretty helpful, that one, Stafford. Yes, there have been problems with the various big ships having issues with seals. One of the issues is when you're doing building the ships they are, especially when they are going around, they're being built in sections and then brought together, is that it's keeping track on the age of some of the seals and some of the joints. And when you're dealing with the size of the ship and working out the exact maintenance record you're going to need and when you're going to need to check something. New, uh, new IKB 472. Will you say this your ghost story sometimes? Maybe. Maybe. 
Rapid Ray's like, I'm jealous that you've got done Discovery and got a book published without an agent. To be fair, I haven't got a book agent, but I do have a television agent. And they do get me a lot of work. And I've also got a program coming up on a French program, a uh, French channel, about the New Schoenstein Castle. Because there was an issue with finding historians to talk about it. And they kept trying to find engineering historians. And they were all very, very... Um, let's put it this way. They, they were trying very hard. But... I was possibly a bit more natural in front of the camera, a bit more experienced maybe. I don't know what it is, but apparently I've tested better in front of the camera. So I ended up doing a whole com a whole program about castle design and castle construction. Because I teach that to my civil engineering students. Felix B, the information war worked. We Swiss kids played Argentine in a plane by crashing into the water. Sounds fun. Costranos, how does the review process work with monographic manuscripts in academic work? Uh, it's complicated. If I give you an example, one journal article is, I think, published either this year or going uh, later this year on Marine du Nord. And that has been going through review for about four and a half years since writing and then to get through to review and publication. I've got another one. I've got another three stacked behind that. And I've honestly given up writing journal articles until they're all published because I'm just to an extent fed up with writing them and then, I'm not, then taking ages to actually get out there. Hence, I'm now concentrating on books because it's actually been quicker to get a book put together and published than it has been a journal article. I was asking, Castle Design is construction. You should have talked with, uh, talked with Shad from Shadiversity. I'd love to have a chat with Shadiversity because I think he's amazing. He does excellent stuff. And I find it a really engaging style. I know there are... Some things, he sometimes gets things wrong. But like me, I like the fact that he, when I got something wrong, I went back and corrected myself. He goes back and corrects himself. And I consider that a sign of a good historian. And someone who's got good passion about history. Kingsrook, any hints as to what you'll be covering in the next Admiral Showcase? Hmm. Blowside, you did some ca uh, some on camera work on New Shrine Sound Castle. Where can we see it? It's going to be on French and then British new uh, British television, and it's going to be uh, come out over Christmas period. My name is Tolkien on seals and whatnot. I've been told that when a ship is in harbour, one needs often to keep the screws turning so that the shaft doesn't seize up. How true is this, and is it a constant thing? They do try and turn them occasionally because um, part of the seal mechanism does work better if they've been turned. It keeps things lubricated properly rather than allowing things to pull in places. But it's very, very slow and it's sometimes, it's sometimes not done at all depending on the ship. If they don't think they're going to be in harbour for a long time, they might not bother it. If they're in harbour for, going to be in harbour for a while, they might well do it, especially if they're not going into dry dock. Castle Trams, I got burned with journal articles. Freaking ridiculous. I can't publish on my specialty, but I can on other topics. Yes, uh, that is the joy of some academic stuff. Sure, Mac. I may or may not know what is coming and think you guys will like it, if I know, of course. You do know, of course, Sean Mac, and it's go the Admiral stuff is all going to be a Christmas specials when it comes on, but uh, me and Sean are working on it. Sean is very kindly helping me with some of the research and putting together it, and he's going to be in the videos as well. <laughs> this is the part of the thing. If people suggest very good ideas, but they're going to be big projects, 
Then, as Dan will testify to, and Sean testifies to, will hopefully testify to, I have a habit of including them in the videos because I think it's A, they deserve some credit, and B, they enjoy, uh, they're good. And Dan is also setting up his own channel and doing some of the things himself. So that's quite cool. I keep having visions when you were talking about seals of either USN special forces attacking or fish eating ma ma fish eating mammal wandering on the ship like some sort of large fish smelling gremlin. Um, actually, there were a few seals which took up residence on various cruisers during the Arctic uh, Arctic convoys, but we'll leave that to one side. I finished the iron brew for the evening, so I'll take the last few questions and then I will wander off because, honestly, I've drunk a lot of iron brew today. And thank you very much again to everyone who's been super chat. Thank you to everyone who's a patron. Thank you to everyone who's subscribed. Thank you to everyone who shares the videos and talks about. Thank you to everyone who listens to bilge pumps. We have a lot of fun and we want to keep that going and. The more people who listen to it, the more people who share it, the better it is, because we get so much fun suggestions. This week we are diving into the American new doctrine of network. Uh, we have a special coming up for Navy Con. We have next uh, this uh, next week's uh, publication. So then, this week's publication coming is on. New, new, new US Navy's network sort of ideas. The one after that is going to be an uh, interview with a guy called Steve George, who's a former Royal Navy engineer, aircraft engineering officer who was down in the Falklands War and has also worked on the F 35 project and is frankly amazing. And then the one after that will hopefully be with my girlfriend. So, um, yeah. Mm-hmm. Danny Freeman, I have only brought two or three books in preparation for talking about Long Naval Conference on Night Minute. Only two or three. Only two or three, yeah. Rabbi Rosen, my father thinks your 40-minute series is lunacy, but thinks it would raise all manner of hyenas <laughs> and logistics if we mounted on the C-1-1. It would be interesting, but I... It, it, the thing is, I'm looking at them and I'm going, this is the options we've got. 40 millimeter closer. We're already looking at 30 millimeter. It's not that much bigger. Very fancy. There's a YouTube channel called Chief Maka. He's a chief engineer of a big motion. There are lots of interesting stuff about how the ship is run and so on. Oh, cool. Um, Jerison, what about the iguana infestation on the second Russian Pacific fleet? And the man eating crocodile and venomous snakes. Oh, <laughs> there's so many fun stories in the history. And uh, kind of question: Have you seen Drax bombardment of Ancona video? Yes, but not all of it. Um, Ronda boy, I your stern tube and line sh uh, shaft bearings have independent electric pumps for lubrication. Yep, they do. Rotor boy, he said ships were not boats. I'm not sure what's going on, but hello, Rotor boy. I don't think I've seen you before. Um, no, Scott, is there a naval turret monster the same way that there is a tank turret monster that grabs things left close to the turret ring, be that tools, kit, body parts, anything to hand? Yes. You keep very clear of some of the moving parts. Um, new IKB 472. What was the title of this French castle program? Uh, new Schwanstein Castle Examined. I think. In English. No, I'm still praying for the jingles to be on the Well, he's more than welcome. I'm waiting for Drac to invite him. <sighs> also, we can't all start our own channels. I already have too much to watch if I try to keep my day job. <laughs> Golki was a 30mm Gawa Avenger, whereas Phalanx only used a 20mm. M621 Vulcan. Why did the RN go from Goalkeeper to Phalanx? A rate of fire and, volume and serviceability. Plus, the Americans were doing more updates than was available for Goalkeeper. 
Carmen, unfortunately, what my area of history has history-wise is mostly coloured by uh, you day 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 practices sudden lone boat and mine counter measures. You don't write. Hmm. Carl, there might be a thing to look into for you. You might be interested. Uh, uh, go check the Discord. There is something that's on. Uh, that's about the. There's a current pro uh, project to build a Felix Stowe FE2 from new, and you might be interested in that if you're interested, that's what you're interested in. Um, Steve White, my first boss at the airport 55 years ago was a crewman on the USS Saratoga. I spent winters refabric wings for shit as demons, biplane trains. Ooh. Thank you. 30 mm ammo for CLS is 30 times 103, but 40 mm for both oils, et al., is 40 times 365. I'd guess it's quite a bit bigger. Well, yes, but it's also quite a bit cooler. But leaving that to one side, it's bigger in lengthwise, but it's not that bigger in size wise. In sort of width wise so actually you can store quite a lot especially as ships are grown bigger in size read the aircraft for car at car hum ah yes twitter.com uh, boaty plane status yep Dan Freeman, I'm tempted to pop up to the RF Museum and film wandering around. That's certainly fun. I always recommend Duxford. Duxford is beautiful, and it gets forgotten a lot. Right, as said, I'm going to finish about now, because, well, I've had a lovely evening, but we have been chatting now for 3 hours and 24 minutes, so I think I'm going to go and, well have a break before I actually record some things on um, sewers. So night night everyone, thank you very much for being here, thank you very much as always for the super chats, for the patrons, for the subscribing, for the sharing, for all that stuff and just thank you. It's always very very kind to have you here, I'm sorry my room is still a bit of a mess but eventually we are going to get our home offices and then we are going to have a lovely time. And things are going to hopefully be easier. Okay, so take care, Jay Richardson. Take care, Greg Southowski. Take care, Rapid Razorback. Dirt Squad, thank you. Night, night. Um, Carl Harmon, night, night. I want to go back to Yeovilton next year. Yeovilton's always worth a visit. Nick Waters, thank you. Take care. John Shea, thank you. Uh, Stephen White, good night. Take care. Staff Thompson, night, night. Take care. Dan Freeman, as always, thank you. Cottage around this. Night, night. William Bolton. Hello. Oh, darn, I missed it. <laughs> Sorry, William. And Yickers. Thank you. All right, take care, everyone. That squad, thank you. And Grace Housey, good night. Good night, everyone. Thank you. Take care. Take care, Sean Mack. Thank you. Buckingham, take care, night night, and King's Rook, thank you. And KGV, if you're out there, night night, thank you. And Felix B, thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Alistair Crow. Take care.